Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My name is Muhammad Abdul Hadi and inshallah we will begin today's program with the recitation of the Holy Quran by brother Farik Zakir Naik أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قاف والقرآن المجيد بل عجبوا أن جاءهم منذر منهم فقال الكافرون هذا شيء عجيب أئذا متنا وكنا ترابا ذلك رجع بعيد قد علمنا ما تنقص الأرض منهم وعندنا كتاب حفيظ بل كذبوا بالحق لما جاءهم فهم في أمر مريج أفلم ينظروا إلى السماء فوقهم كيف بنيناها فوقهم كيف بنيناها وزيناها وما لها من فروج والأرض مددناها وألقينا فيها رواسي وأنبتنا وأنبتنا فيها من كل زوج بهيج تبصرة وذكرى لكل عبد منيب ونزلنا من السماء ماء مباركا فأنبتنا فأنبتنا به جنات وحب الحصيد والنقل باسقات لها تلع النزيد رزقا للعباد رزقا للعباد وأحيينا به بلدة ميتا كذلك الخروج كذبت قبلهم قوم نوح وأصحاب الرس وسمود وعاد وفرعون وإخوان لوط وأصحاب الأيكة وقوم تبع كل كذب الرسل فحق وعيد أفعينا بالخلق الأول بل هم في لبس من خلق جديد صدق الله العظيم Jazakallahu khairan. The translation of the verses that Brother Farag just recited, which are from Surah Qaf, Surah number 50, Ayat, verses 1 to 15. Qaf, by the honored Quran. But they wonder that there has come to them a foreigner from among themselves. And the disbelievers say, 
this is an amazing thing. When we have died and have become dust, we will return to life. That is a distant return. We know what the earth diminishes of them, and with us is a retaining record. But they denied the truth when it came to them, so they are in a confused condition. Have they not looked at the heavens above them, how we structured it and adorned it, and how it has no rifts? And the earth, we spread it out, and cast therein firmly set mountains, and made grow therein something of every beautiful kind, giving insight and a reminder for every servant who turns to Allah. And we have sent down blessed rain from the sky, and made grow thereby gardens and grain from the harvest, and lofty palm trees, having fruit arranged in layers as provision for the servants, and we have given life thereby to a dead land, thus is the resurrection. The people of Noah denied before them, and the companions of the well and Thamud, and Ad and Firaud, and the brothers of Lot, and the companions of the thicket and the people of Tubba, all denied the messengers, so my threat was justly fulfilled. Did we fail in the first creation? But they are in confusion over a new creation. Before I call upon Dr. Zakir Naik, I would like to give his brief introduction. A medical doctor by professional training, Dr. Zakir Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of Islamic Research Foundation, Mumbai. Dr. Zakir clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts, he is 43 years old. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 12 years, by the year 2008, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,200 public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Italy, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, Trinidad, and many other countries, in addition to numerous public talks in India. He has successfully participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, held in Chicago, USA in April 2000 was a resounding success. His interfaith dialogue with prominent Hindu guru Sri Sri Ravi Shankar on the topic, the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures, held at Palace Grounds, Bangalore on 21st Jan 2006, was highly appreciated by people of both the faiths. In the issue dated 22nd February 2009, of the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2009, amongst the billion plus population of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 82. In the special list of the top 10 
spiritual gurus of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number three. After Baba Ramdev and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar being the only Muslim in the entire list. Dr. Zakir Naik stood out most eloquently for Islam and Muslims in the present times on one of the leading and most respected news channel of India, NDTV 24-7. During the Guest This Week interview program, Walk the Talk, conducted by host Shekhar Gupta, editor-in-chief of Indian Express, telecast on 7th and 8th March 2009. Sheikh Ahmed Didat, the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, who had called Dr. Zakir D. Plus in 1994, presented a plague in May 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak for his achievement in the field of da'wah and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years had taken me 40 years to accomplish. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Dr. Zakir Nayak appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 200 countries of the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. More than a hundred of his talks dialogues, debates, and symposia are available on DVDs and VCDs. He has authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Udu ila sabi li rabbika bil hikmah. Wal muahzat al-hasna. Wajadun billati ahasan. Rabbi shali sadri. Waisir li amri. Wahlul ugdata min lisan yafka wa kawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Alhamdulillah, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to be invited for the third time by the Dubai International Holy Quran Award organized by the Dubai government under the patronage of Sheikh Muhammad Ashid al Maktoum the Vice President and Prime Minister of UAE and the rule of Dubai. Today's lecture is Misconceptions about Islam. It is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. It's compulsory for every Muslim to do dawah. Dawah means an invitation a call to the non-Muslims. It is the duty of every Muslim that he invites the non-Muslims towards Islam. There are various different methodologies as well as strategies used by Muslims as far as Dawah is concerned. The most common strategy is whenever a Muslim meets a non-Muslim, he speaks hundred good things about Islam. Even if that non-Muslim agrees with all the hundred good things that the person has spoken about Islam, yet 
that non-Muslim will have few negative points behind the mind. He may say, yes, I agree about all these hundred good things about Islam, but you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same people who spread religion with the sword. You are the people who subjugated the women. Ah, you are the Muslims who marry more than one woman. These few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. That's the reason. Whenever I meet any non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable that he can criticize Islam if he wants to attack Islam. I make him comfortable and I ask him, what does he feel is wrong with the religion of Islam? And after he's made comfortable, he poses about three or four questions about Islam. And in the past couple of decades that I've been in the field of Dawah, I have realized that there are about 20 most common questions which the non-Muslims have regarding Islam. When the non-Muslim poses three or four questions about Islam, invariably, these three or four questions fall amongst the 20 most common questions. If all the Muslims know the reply to these 20 common questions posed by the non-Muslims with reason, logic, and science, with the quotation from Quran and Sahih Hadith, and the quotation of the scripture of the non-Muslim, even if he cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, at least he can neutralize the animosity that is there in the minds of the non-Muslims. At least he can neutralize the negative feeling that the person has regarding Islam. That's the reason it's very important that we Muslims are aware about these 20 common questions. How do these 20 common questions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims? Every day, the non-Muslims, they are being bombarded by the international media regarding misinformation about Islam. There is virulent propaganda regarding Islam in the international media. Whether you read the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the television satellite channels, the internet, we find there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. And depending how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions, they keep on changing. The 20 common questions that were there a couple of decades earlier, they were different than what they are today. The 20 common questions a couple of decades later may change again. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, similarly, the 20 common questions keep on changing in the minds of the non-Muslims. And believe me, by Allah's grace, I have traveled to most of the major countries in the world. USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Malaysia, South Africa, India. Wherever you travel, these 20 common questions are the same. There may be an additional one or two questions depending upon the local surrounding and the environment of that place. For example, if you go in the Western countries, there may be an additional question. Why does Islam prohibit the taking and giving of interest? But the remaining 20 common questions are the same. If every Muslim masters the reply to these 20 common questions, he will be able to do the fard, the compulsory act of da'wah to the non-Muslims. When you appear for an examination, if you at least want to pass with a good grade, not excellent, at least good grade, what you do, you read the guide. You know, in India, we have the Nauni 21 most likely questions. If you want to appear and pass favorably well, then you study the most common questions. In India, we have Naunit, 21 most likely questions to appear in the examination. In every country, you have such books that if you want to do a shortcut and at least pass as far as the exam is concerned, similarly, these 20 common questions will at least make you a part-time die. 
if it cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, it will at least remove the animosity that is there in the mind of the non-Muslim. Time may not permit me to cover all the 20 questions in this time due to the limited time that I have. You can surely go on the internet on our website www.irf.net where all these answers are given in detail. There may be certain non-Muslims who may go out of the way and read material against Islam. For example, they may go to the anti-Islamic sites. They may read books which are written against Islam. As far as these non-Muslims are concerned, who go out of the way to find additional material against Islam, for that, we have another 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who have gone to anti-Islamic sites and have read material against Islam. That we won't discuss today. That is, if you want to get, you know, maybe first class or distinction, you have to do that. The reply to these 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who go to anti-Islamic sites is also given on our website, www.irf.net. As far as today is concerned, I will try and cover the major questions, the first, more than 50 percent at least, of the 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims regarding Islam. The first number one misconception regarding Islam, the top of the charts, is regarding jihad. Today, jihad is the most misunderstood word regarding Islam. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it is even misunderstood by many of us Muslims. Non-Muslims and main Muslims think that jihad means any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for power, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for land, whether it be for language, any war fought by any Muslim for any reason is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for money, whether it be for power, whether it be for land, whether it be for language. Jihad is an Arabic word which comes from the word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclinations. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to fight against oppression. Jihad also means to fight in self-defense in the battlefield. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic, we say the student is doing jihad, he's striving and struggling. Many people have a misconception and they think that jihad can only be done by a Muslim. There are many verses in the Quran which say that even non-Muslim did jihad. Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail, the mother bore you, and in pain did she give you birth. Immediately after praising the parents, especially the mother, the verse continues. Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 15 says that, but if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle, to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides Almighty God, of whom you have no knowledge, then don't obey them. But yet, live with them with love and companionship. Here the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents doing jihad, striving and struggling to make their children do shirk, worship somebody else besides Allah. A similar message is given in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8 that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if their parents do jihad, they strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides Almighty God, then don't obey them. So here the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents doing jihad. And there are various such examples of Quran mentioning non-Muslims doing jihad. Now this type of jihad in Arabic, we say jihad fi sabil shaitan. Jihad 
in the way of the Satan. What we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabilillah, jihad in the way of Allah. And whenever the word is mentioned individually about jihad, in the Islamic context, it is understood it is jihad fi sabilillah. Most of the non-Muslims, including many so-called Muslim scholars, inverted commas, they translate jihad as the holy war. Holy war, if you translate in Arabic, it means harbu muqaddasa. If you read the Quran, if you read the Hadith, there is no Quranic verse, there is no Hadith which uses the word harbu muqaddasa. The word holy war doesn't exist in the Quran, neither in the Hadith. Jihad, as I mentioned, basically means to strive and struggle. And one type of jihad is also fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is kital in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But jihad doesn't basically mean a war. One type of jihad, the various jihad for nafs, one type of jihad is fighting in self-defense in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we see the history of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the first 13 years of his prophet that he lived in Makkah, there were many Quranic verses that were revealed, all the Makkah surahs. Many a time in these verses, the word jihad was used. And never did the Muslims ever fight, physically fight. Only when they migrated to Medina, then the wars took place. But yet you find the word jihad in several verses of the Quran which were revealed in Makkah. Many examples I can give you. For example, the Quran says in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that those who do jihad in the way of Allah, those who strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we open up the pathways for them. When the verse was revealed, there was no war at that time. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 52, that do not follow the unbelievers, but do jihad against them, strive against them strenuously with the Quran. That means you do jihad with the Quran. Jihad with the Quran means strive to convey the message of Allah. Do you think you're going to fight with the Quran? So here we realize that this misconception regarding the word jihad it is depending how the media portrays. This word jihad wasn't a problem a couple of decades earlier. After 9-11, it came on top of the charts, number one. Previously, it wasn't there. So depending how the media portrays Islam, these misconceptions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims. For more details on jihad, you can see my lecture, my talk, Terrorism and Jihad and Islamic Perspective. The second most common question today, according to me, that is there in the minds of non-Muslims is that Muslims are fundamentalists. And many a time, we Muslims feel ashamed and we don't know how to reply. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist, by definition, means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a mathematician wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person who wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. If we have a fundamentalist robber in the society, whose profession is to rob, he's a bane for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor, whose profession is to save thousands of human lives, he's good for the society. So depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. 
because I know, follow, and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals which the non-Muslims may think it is against humanity, but the moment you reply to them or tell them the logical reason why these things are there in Islam, there is not a single human being who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. When we go back in history, we come to know that according to the Western dictionary, fundamentalism was first time used to describe a group of American Christians in the early part of the 20th century. These American Christians, they protested against the church and they said, previously the church believed that the complete message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested against the church and said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every letter, every word of the Bible is from Almighty God, then this movement is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we read the Oxford Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient or fundamental doctrines of any religion. But when we read the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a side change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scriptures or fundamentals of any religion, especially Islam. Especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, immediately you start thinking of a Muslim. The Muslims, they're fundamentalists, they're extremists. And we Muslims, we are becoming apologetic. No, 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 I'm not a fundamentalist. No, no, I'm not an extremist. I say, I am an extremist. I'm extremely honest. I'm extremely just. I'm extremely kind. I'm extremely merciful. I'm extremely loving. Can anyone tell me why being extremely just, extremely honest, extremely loving, extremely merciful, extremely kind is bad? What's wrong in being an extremist? The Quran says you have to be extremely honest. You can't be partly honest when benefits you, you're honest. When doesn't benefit you, you're dishonest. The Quran says you have to be extremely honest, extremely just. So if you are a practicing Muslim, you have to be extremely kind, extremely honest, extremely just. We have to be extremist in the correct direction. We should not be extremist in the wrong direction. But a Muslim should be extremist in following the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 28, Allah says, Utkhluf is still mikafa. Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. You can't say partly. So why are the Muslims becoming apologetic? The media is attacking Islam and unfortunately, we Muslims, we have the best deen. But why are we afraid? Why are we apologetic? It's time that we turn the tables over. The third most common misconception is Muslims are terrorists. And after 9-11, you had the 7th July, that's the London bombing, and there was a common statement which said, all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And it was very common on the media. And that gave rise to a new lecture of mine. Is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? Time does not permit me to speak in detail about is terrorism a Muslim monopoly. But you're most welcome to see on the Peace TV or on a website. We know from the media that many a time, two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. For example, more than 60 years back, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. 
these people by the british government they were called as terrorist but we common indians we call these people as freedom fighters as patriots same people same activity but two different labels if you agree with the view of the british government that they had a right to rule over india then you have to call these people as terrorist but if you agree with the view of the common indians that britishers came to india to do business they have no right to rule over us then you have to call these people as patriots you have to call these people as freedom fighters same people same activity but two different labels and i very often attend the media and while having interaction with the indian press ask them a question that do you consider bhagat singh as a terrorist so he said no i said why the same western media when they call bhagat singh as a terrorist you say no he's not a terrorist why because you know the background of the history of india freedom even i consider bhagat singh not to be a terrorist but the same western media today when they call muslims they say why do you agree have you done research they try to laugh <laughs> quran says in surah ujra chapter 49 verse number 6 whenever you get information you check it up before you pass to the third person the point to be noted is that when the british government called bhagat singh a terrorist you didn't agree now why do you agree with them why the double standards and you have several such examples when we read the history of the american revolution in 1775 during the american revolution george washington he was called as the terrorist number 1 by the british government when the british was ruling america the british has called george washington as terrorist number 1 later on when america gets its freedom george washington is made the president of usa imagine terrorist number 1 becomes the president of usa <laughs> and he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come including george bush and you find several such examples several you have the example of nelson mandela Nelson Mandela several decades earlier when South Africa was ruled by the white apartheid government Nelson Mandela was arrested and was imprisoned in Robben Islands for more than 25 years by the white apartheid government Nelson Mandela was called as terrorist number 1 later on when South Africa gets its freedom and the white apartheid government is removed Nelson Mandela is given freedom and he gets the Nobel prize for peace Imagine terrorist number 1 of the world gets the Nobel prize for peace not that he was bad and he became good for the same activity for what he was called a terrorist 30 years later he gets the Nobel prize for the same activity Nobel prize for peace <laughs> So we realize whoever is in power whatever label that person gives that gets stuck on to that person This is media Media is very powerful according to me it is the most important weapon today it can convert black into white day into night hero into a villain villain into a hero this is media unfortunately we muslims we are very backward as far as media is concerned our technology you know whatever technology is halal what is permitted in quran and sunnah we have to use it we have to convert it to halal television per se is not haram I do agree 99 percent things that come on television is haram we have to convert the haram into halal and that's how we have to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best way today that you can convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the satellite channel it is the media at least we can give shahada we can tell on the day of judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at least we tried our level best to let the message of islam reach every home or at least as many homes as possible and alhamdulillah summa alhamdulillah since three and a half years after the launch of peace tv now the viewership of peace tv is more than 100 million alhamdulillah people may be wondering that you know why are there so many cameras 
people are saying, why 12 cameras required? One lecture, one man, 12 cameras. One man and 12 cameras. The television channel says, oh, we only use two or three cameras. 12 cameras because we want to present Islam in a beautiful manner. When you have rock show, that time 12 cameras, no problem. When Dai gives the lecture, we have only two cameras. See, today is the age of science and technology. When we want to convince the youngsters, the media is taking them on the wrong track. We have to use the same media to get our youngsters on the right track, from wrong track to the right track. And believe me, we know, I agree, that majority of the media is haram. But as long as we don't break any rule of the Sharia, of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, we can use this media to the benefit of the spread of Islam. The fourth most common misconception in the minds of the non-Muslim is Islam was spread by the sword. What is the meaning of the word Islam? Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting our will to Almighty God. So if I translate, Islam was spread by the sword, it means peace was spread by the sword. It's contradictory. How can peace be spread by the sword? And we know that every human being in the world would not want peace to prevail. Islam is the religion of peace. Its main aim and objective is to spread peace. But every human being in this world would not want peace to prevail. That's the reason every country in the world has a police force. This police force many a time uses force to maintain peace in that country. They don't use force to disrupt peace. If the anti-social elements want to disrupt peace, the police of the various countries, they use force to maintain peace in that country. Similarly, in Islam, Islam is against violence. It's against fighting. It's against using force, except as a last resort to maintain peace. Similarly, Islam does give permission to use force to let justice and peace prevail in that land. And the best reply to this allegation that Islam was spread by the sword is given very well by a very famous historian by the name of Delisi O'Leary. In the book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number eight, history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. I will repeat his statement. Delacy O'Leary says in the book Islam at the Crossword, page number eight, that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. Which sword? We Muslims, we ruled Spain for 800 years. We didn't do the job. We didn't convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Later on, the Crusaders came, the Christians came, and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the azan. If you read history, the religion that was spread by force was the religion of Christianity. If you read history, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in the name of Christianity. And today, the same people are telling that Islam was spread by the sword. We Muslims, we have been the rulers of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came, for a few years the French came, but as a whole, the Muslims have been the rulers of the Arab land for the past 14 years. Yet today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christians in generation. These 14 million Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam wasn't spread by the sword.
We Muslims, we ruled India for more than a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have converted each and every Indian and the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, more than 80% of the Indians are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. Today, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims, it is Indonesia. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia? Malaysia has more than 50% Muslims. Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The reply is given by Thomas Carlyle, a very famous historian from Europe. He writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, and he places Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero. And he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, that which sword? First, you have to find your sword. Which sword? First, you have to find your sword. Every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's head, it dwells alone. One man against the whole world. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. You have to find your sword. He's talking about the sword of intellect. Which sword has made hundreds and thousands of human beings to accept Islam? He's talking about the sword of intellect. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, he says, Udu ila sabil rabbika bhalikma, wa mu'azid hasna, wajadun billati ya asan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them, and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. It is the sort of reason, logic, which is conquering the hearts of the people. It's not the sort of metal. Even if we had the sword of steel, we could not use it. Because Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. But truth stands out clear from error. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sort of intellect, the sort of reasoning. There was a survey done by the reader Rajesh Almanik yearbook in 1984. And the article was reprinted in the Plain Truth magazine. It did a survey of the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And in that survey, the religion that spread maximum number one, it was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I am asking a simple question. Which war took place in the span of 50 years between 1934 and 1984, which forced tens of thousands of human beings to accept Islam. Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I am asking who is forcing these Americans and Europeans to accept Islam? Which thought? Today, the media is attacking Islam and saying Islam subjugates the woman. Do you know, out of those accepting Islam in America and Europe, two-thirds of them are women. If Islam subjugates the woman, why are the American women, why are the European women accepting Islam? Who is forcing them? <laughs> Yesterday, we saw, mashallah, a Westerner, a lady. Mashallah, she gave shahada, she accepted Islam. Who forced her? Did we use the sword? We use the sword of intellect. The sword of reasoning. To end the answer to this question on was Islam spread with the sword, I'd like to quote to you the saying of Adam Pearson. Adam Pearson says, people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. The fifth most common question asked by the non-Muslim is, why does Islam allow 
a Muslim man who have more than one wife. This before 9-11 was number one, top of the charts. Now it has become number five. Depending on the media portrays. So previously the woman issue was number one. Now terrorism jihad has overtaken. Previously, if you read my top 20, if you have my old lecture, number one was regarding polygamy. The question is, why does Islam allow a man to marry more than one wife? Why does Islam permit polygamy? Polygamy means a person having more than one spouse. Polygamy is divided into two types, polygyny and polyandry. When a man has more than one wife, it's called as polygyny. And if a woman has more than one husband, it is called as polyandry. Islam permits limited polygyny and prohibits polyandry. In fact, if you read the Quran, Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which says marry only one. There's no other religious book on the face of the earth. You read the Bible, you read the Veda, you read the Bhagavad Gita, you read the Talmud. There is no religious book on the face of the earth besides the Quran which says marry only one. If you read Raman, it's mentioned that the father of Sri Ram, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. If you read Mahabharat, Sri Krishna, how many wives he had? Four, ten, hundred, thousand, sixteen thousand one hundred and eight. So when Shri Krishna can have 16,108 wives, then why can't we Muslim have maximum four? <laughs> if you read the Bible, according to Christianity, a man can have as many wives as he wishes. It is later on, the Christian church has put a restriction that a Christian should marry only one wife. Furthermore, if you read the Talmud, if you read the Jewish scriptures, it says, also in the Old Testament, that Abraham, peace be upon him, he had three wives according to the Bible. Solomon had 700 wives. So according to Judaism, you can marry as many as you wish, 100, 200, 1000, no upper limit. It is later on, Rabbi Gershom ben Yehuda, 950 to 1030 C, he passed a synoid. He passed an edict saying that Jews should only marry one woman. And in the Sephardic Jewish community who lived amongst the Muslims, they married more than one wife till as late as 1950. Later on, the chief rabbi of Israel put a ban and said, all the Jews should marry only one wife. But according to the scriptures, you can marry as many as you wish. Same thing. According to Hindu scriptures, you can marry as many as you wish. If you read the statistics of the status of women in Islam, which was published on page number 6667, it says that the Muslims in India, 4.31% did polygamous marriages. 4.31% of the Muslims in India did polygamous marriages. And the Hindus that did polygamous marriages was 5.06. 0.75% more than the Muslims in a span of 10 years. From 1951 to 1961, the Hindus in India did more polygamous marriages than the Muslims in India. Though the Indian law says that the Hindus cannot marry more than one wife, the Muslims can marry. Though it's illegal yet, Hindus did 5.06% polygamous marriages, 0.75% more as compared to the Muslims. If it was allowed legally, I don't know how much percentage the Hindus would reach to. <laughs> so the Hindu scriptures give permission for the Hindus to marry as many wives as they wish. It is later on, in 1954, according to the Indian Penal Code, the Indian government put a restriction and passed a special marriage act known as Hindu Marriage Act. Special Hindu Marriage Act which said that Hindus should only marry one woman. So the restriction came in 1954, not in the scriptures. The scriptures say you can marry as many as you wish. 5, 10, 20, 100, 10,000, as many as you wish. What does Islam say? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, 
marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. Quran says, marry women of your choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. That means only if you can do justice can you marry two, three, or four. Otherwise, marry only one. Quran also says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 129, it is difficult to be just between your wives. But don't turn away from them altogether. Many people think it is compulsory in Islam that you should have four wives. It is not compulsory in Islam to have four wives. It is optional. Marrying more than one woman is optional in Islam. It is mubah. But if you marry more than one woman, and if you don't do justice, then you're in problem. So if you marry more than one woman, you should be able to do justice between them. Let us analyze what are the logical reasons why Islam permits a Muslim man to have more than one wife. By nature, we know males and females are born in equal proportion. But in the pediatric age itself, you ask any medical doctor, he will tell you that medically, the female sex is the stronger sex. The female child has more immunity than a male child. The female child can fight the germs and diseases much better than the male child. So in pediatric age itself, there are more deaths among the male children as compared to female children. So in the pediatric age itself, there are more females as compared to males. There are wars taking place. In the wars, there are more men who are being killed as compared to women. As life goes on, deaths take place due to accidents due to alcoholism, due to drug addiction, due to disease. In all these cases, more males are dying as compared to females. And today's statistics tell us that the average span of a woman is much more than the average span of a man. Today, there are more females in the world as compared to males. In some third world countries, like India, where I come from, the female population is less than the male population. And the reason is, because of female infanticide and female feticide. There's a program by the name Let Her Die. Under the banner assignment, it came on BBC, where a British reporter by the name of Emily Beckenin, she says that every day more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females. In India alone, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females. If you multiply this number by 365, the number of days in a year, we get a figure of more than 1 million fetuses are being aborted every year in India after they identified that they're females. And according to the report of the government hospital of Tamil Nadu, out of 10 females born alive, four are put to death. If this evil practice of female infanticide and female fetuses stops in India, even in India, in a few decades, the female population will outnumber the male population. Today, when we analyze throughout the world, there are more females as compared to males. In New York alone, there are 1 million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And God alone knows how many millions of females are more than the males throughout the world. If I agree with a non-Muslim, that every man should marry only one woman, and suppose my sister, or suppose your sister happens to live in USA, and if the market is saturated, every woman has found a life partner for herself. Yet, there will be 7.8 million females who will not find husbands. And if, unfortunately, your sister or my sister happens to live in USA, and if she's amongst one of those 7.8 million females who has not found a husband, what's the option she has? The only option she has is that she either marries a man who already has a wife, or she becomes public property. Public property? Many people say, Dr. Zakir Nai, such a harsh word. It is the most sophisticated word I can use. I cannot think of a better word. There's no option. She either marries a man who already has a wife or becomes public property. 
in America, having mistresses is very common. The American statistics tell us, on an average, a man has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one. Eight different. Some may have five, some may have ten, some may have twenty. Eight different sexual partners before he marries. After marry, how many has the statistics? Doesn't say that. But before he marries, he has on an average eight different sexual partners. Having mistresses in America is common, no problem. Ten, twenty, no problem. Having two wives doesn't go down their throat. You know, when a woman becomes the second wife of a man, she gets honor, she gets a right, she lives a very peaceful life with grace, with honor, with all her rights. And when a woman is a mistress, she doesn't get her rights, she has no protection, she leads a life of disgrace. Therefore, Islam permits some men to have more than one wife to protect the woman. And I do agree. If someone tells me that no woman would like to share the husband, I agree with them. I don't argue. I agree with you that no woman under normal circumstances would like to share the husband. But the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. That means a good Muslimah who knows the situation of the world would not mind sharing a husband to prevent her sister from becoming a public property. You ask any modest woman, would she prefer becoming the wife of a man who already has a wife or becoming public property? Any modest woman would choose the first one. Sixth most common question. If Islam allows a man to have more than one wife, why does not Islam allow a woman to have more than one husband? As far as marrying women is concerned, the category of women a man can marry is clearly specified in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 22 to 24. And it's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24, that you cannot marry a woman who's already married. That means in Islam, a woman cannot have more than one husband. Before I give you the real reason, imagine there's already a scarcity of women finding husband. If a woman has more than one husband, this scarcity will increase. It will multiply the problem. Let's analyze what are the logical reasons that Islam prohibits a woman to have more than one husband. When a man has more than one wife, and if any child is born out of that wedlock, you can easily identify who is the father as well as who is the mother. But if a woman has more than one husband, and if a child is born, you can identify the mother, but you will not be able to identify the father. <laughs> and if you go to admit that child in school, and if they ask you what is the name of the father, you may have to give two names. <laughs> and today, psychology, they tell us that identifying the parents is very important for a healthy childhood, especially the identity of the father. If you cannot identify the parents, the child has a lot of mental trauma. Today, after science has advanced, I'm aware that there is DNA testing and genetic testing where you can identify who is the father and who is the mother, though it's not very accurate. But even if I agree that maybe after a few years it becomes accurate, yet it has happened recently. All these years it wasn't there. And this is not the only reason why a woman is not allowed to have more than one husband. There are various other reasons. For example, today science tells us that a man is more polygamous in nature as compared to a woman. Today science tells us that because of the various behavioral and psychological changes that take place in a woman during menstrual cycle, she cannot do the role of multiple wives simultaneously. Whereas a man, he can do the role of multiple husbands simultaneously. Furthermore, if a woman has more than one husband or more than one sexual partner, and if all of them are loyal to each other, yet there are high chances that venereal diseases and sexual transmitted disease will emerge, and it can be retransmitted back to the man. Whereas if a man 
Today, medical science tells us that if a man has more than one sexual partner, has more than one wife, and if all of them are loyal to one another, there are hardly any chances of venereal diseases or sexually transmitted diseases emerging in them. So scientifically, also, and medically, it's no problem for a man to have more than one wife, but it's problematic for a woman to have more than one husband. The seventh most common question, or the seventh misconception in Islam, in the minds of non-Muslim is that why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil? Why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her in hijab? Before I discuss the reason of hijab, let us analyze what was the status of the woman in the past civilizations. When we read the history of Babylonian civilization, it says that women were ill-treated. And if a man committed murder, his wife was put to death. This was the law. If you read the history of the Greek civilization, known as a very great civilization, at that time, they believed in an imaginary woman by the name of Pandora, who was the cause of all the evil in the society. In that great Greek civilization, women were used for sex and pleasure. Prostitution was common. When you read the history of Roman civilization, even in Roman civilization, the women were looked down upon. Nudity and prostitution was common. When we read the history of Egyptian civilization, the woman was considered as an evil and she was called as an instrument of the devil. When we read the history of Arab civilization, before Quran was revealed, the Arabs, very often, they buried the female alive after she was born. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. After the revelation of the Quran, this evil practice has stopped, but yet it persists in other parts of the world. Islam, alhamdulillah, uplifted the woman. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, was the major benefactor in giving the rights to the woman. And after Islam has given rights to the woman, it has even shown us a way how that woman should maintain her status. Hijab has been prescribed to the woman so that she maintains the status and doesn't go back to the old days. Normally, people talk about hijab for the woman, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then speaks about the hijab for the woman. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his case. This is what the Quran says. Once, there was a Muslim man who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? This is haram in Islam. He told me, a beloved prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean when he said, the first glance is forgiven, second is prohibited? What the Prophet meant was that if you unintentionally look at a woman, don't look at her again. That does not mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. The next verse of Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 31, speaks about the hijab for the woman. That whenever a woman looks at a man, and if any breath and thought comes, she should lower her gaze. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the glorious Quran and Hadith regarding the clothing of hijab. The first is the extent. As far as for the man is concerned, the extent is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria for the man and the woman are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, they should be loose. It should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. The third, it should not be transparent or translucent so that a person can see through it. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. 
These are basically the six criteria for hijab regarding clothing, but this does not constitute the complete hijab. The complete hijab besides the hijab of the clothing also includes the behavior, the conduct, the attitude, as well as the intention of the person. Besides the hijab of the clothing, there's hijab of the eyes, hijab of the heart, hijab of the mind, hijab of the thought. It even includes where a person talks, the way a person walks, the way a person behaves. This is the complete hijab. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak, they should put on the jilbab, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. I'd like to ask you a question. Let's suppose two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful, if they are walking down the streets of Dubai, walking down along the Cornish, and if one twin sister, she's wearing the Islamic hijab, the complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist, and the other twin sister, she's wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or shorts. And if both of them are walking down the streets in Dubai, along the Cornish, and if on the side there is a ruffian who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl, I'm asking the question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will it tease the girl wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or short? Which girl will it tease? Which girl? But natural, the girl wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or short. If you're inviting, then you'll receive. Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed to prevent the woman from being molested. And after this, if anyone rapes any woman, the Islamic Sharia says death penalty. Many non-Muslims say death penalty in this age of 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. But when I ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that suppose, God forbid, someone rapes your mother or someone rapes your sister. And if you are made the judge and the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give him? Believe me, all of them said, 100%, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. If someone rapes your mother, your wife, your sister, you want to put him to death. Someone rapes somebody else's mother, somebody else's sister, you say, death penalty, barbaric law. Why these double standards? Why? And do you know, America, USA, which happens to be the most advanced country in the world, do you know it has one of the highest rates of rape in the world? The country which has one of the highest rate of rape in the world is USA. According to the FBI statistics of 1990, every day, 1,756 cases of rape took place. According to the statistics of U.S. Department of Justice, in 1996, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. 1990, 1,756. 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans got bold, bolder. In six years' time, they got more bold. If you calculate, every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in America. You know, we are here in this auditorium for the past one and a half hour. Already 150 rapes may have taken place in USA till the time we are here. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, any man looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. The woman should be modestly dressed, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And after that, any man rapes any woman, capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia, you get results. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. You implement the Sharia, you get results. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman, 
when it speaks about women's liberalization, it's nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubines, butterflies, and mistresses, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture, the Westerners, they're selling their daughters, they're selling their mothers. And you see it very common. In most of the ads, invariably, you have to find a woman. You see an ad of a motorcycle, how many women ride motorcycle? Yet you see a woman in the ad of motorcycle. In the ad of a car, percentage-wise, a small percentage of women drive cars. Yet you'll find a woman in the ad of a car. And I was told about a very famous advertisement ad of the BMW. You know BMW car? It's in competition with Mercedes. The youngsters, they prefer BMW. It has a better pickup. It is fast. Someone told me in one of the very famous ads of BMW, there was a woman who was standing in front of the car with a bikini and the ad read, test driver now, who, the girl or the car? <laughs> so in the name of women liberalization, they are selling their daughters. They are selling their mothers. We love our daughters. We love our mothers. We love our wives. If the hijab subjugates the woman and protects her, we love this subjugation. We love this subjugation and we love this protection. If this is your freedom in the name of women liberalization, selling your body, selling yourself, we are very happy with our religion. Islam has prescribed women hijab to protect her and to uplift her. And we see today the same thing is happening in the Western world. Same thing what happened in Greek civilization, Roman civilization, women in the name of liberalization, art, culture, modeling, fashion, TV, all this you see, what are they doing? Going back to the old age. The eighth most common question as by non-Muslim is that why does Islam permit a Muslim to have non-veg food? You know, killing animal is a ruthless act. So why does Islam permit a Muslim to have non-vegetarian food? I would like to mention at the outset that a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. There's no verse in the Quran that, that says it's compulsory for the Muslim to have non-veg food. But since the Quran and our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given permission for the human beings to have non-veg, why should we not have? The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 1, Ya ayyolazina amnu, O you believe, fulfill your obligations and eat of the four-footed animals with the exception name. Eat of the meat of the four-footed animals with the exception name. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 5, We have created for you cattle, and from it you derive warmth and many benefits, and of the meat you can eat. Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, that verily in the cattle is an instructive sign for you. We give you to drink from what is within the bodies, and you derive many benefits from them, and of their meat you can eat. So when Quran has given permission to have the meat of the lawful animals, then why should we Muslims not have it? Let's analyze the scientific as well as the logical reasons for having non veg food. Today, science tells us that in non-vegetarian food, it is a wholesome food. It's rich in protein. And the body requires amino acid. There are eight amino acids which are not created in the body. It has to be given by the external diet. It's known as essential amino acids. Only in the flesh food do you have all the eight essential amino acids. Therefore, the meat is called as a complete protein. There is no vegetarian food which has all the essential amino acids in it. Furthermore, meat is rich in niacin, vitamin B, and it's a wholesome food. There are many non-Muslims, especially the Hindus, they say that, why do Muslims have non-veg? Indians, besides India, they're present throughout the world, 20% population of the world. You go to any part in the world, 
U S A, Canada, U K, Dubai. You will find Indians there. So it has become a common question throughout the world. I tell them that if you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals, cow, goat, sheep, they only have vegetables. If you see the set of teeth, they have a flat set of teeth called as herbivorous set of teeth. If we analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animals who only have flesh food, lion, tiger, leopard, they have pointed set of teeth. They have the canine set of teeth. If you analyze the set of teeth of the human beings, if you go in the mirror and see, we have flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us the pointed teeth, the canine teeth? For what? <laughs> to have non-veg. Furthermore, if we analyze the digestive system of the herbivorous animals, cow, goat, sheep, they can only digest vegetables. If they take flesh food, they will not be able to digest it. If we analyze the digestive system of the carnivorous animals, the tiger, the leopard, the lion, they can only digest flesh food. They cannot digest vegetables. But the digestive system of the human beings can digest veg food as well as non-veg food. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us a digestive system which can even digest non-veg food? But natural to have it. We have a small intestine as well as a large intestine for having both veg food and non-veg food. We are neither herbivorous, neither carnivorous. We are omnivorous. And many of the Hindus have a misconception that Hinduism prohibits a human being from having non-veg food. If you read the scriptures of the Hindus, in several scriptures, several places it says that sages, saints had non-veg food. If you read Manu Smriti, chapter number 5, verse number 30, it says that the eater, if he eats the flesh of the thing which is to be eaten, then it is good. Even if he does it day after day, because God has created some to be eaten and some to become eater. When you read Manu Smriti, chapter number 5, verse number 31, it says that eating meat in sacrifice is not a sin. It is the law of the gods. It's mentioned in Manu Smriti, chapter number 5, verse number 39, as well as 40, that God created sacrificial animals. So killing animals in sacrifice is not considered as killing. Furthermore, when you read Mahabharat, Anushasan Parv, chapter number 88, regarding the Pandavas, the five brothers, the eldest brother Yudhishthir, he asks Bhishma that while they were doing puja, yagna for the ancestors, he asks Bhishma that what should we give in puja, in yagna, so that our ancestors will be satisfied. So Bhishma replies that if you put in the puja herbs, vegetables, and fruits, the ancestors will be satisfied for one month. If you give fish, two months. If you give meat, three months. If you give hair, four months. If you give meat of the goat, five months. If you give bacon, meat of the pig, six months. If you give birds, seven months. If you give deer, eight months. And the menu continues. If you give a buffalo, 11 months. And if you give cow, our ancestors will be satisfied for one full year. That is beef. And if you give rhinoceros meat or red meat of goat, our ancestors will be satisfied inexhaustibly. There's a big menu, imagine. Vegetables, fish, meat, hair, what, everything is there in the menu. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, it was permitted to have non-veg. It is later on, when the Hindus were being influenced by other non-Hindus and tried to take their philosophy that they converted and tried to make the religion into vegetarianism, though all Hindus aren't vegetarians. Now when we ask these people, that why are you a vegetarian? They tell us that killing animal is a sin. Because killing living creatures is a sin. So I said, I agree with you. If a person can live without killing living creatures, I'm with you. 
Today, science tells us that even the plants have got life. Previously, people did not know that plants and vegetables had life. So now the logic has changed. No, no, we understand, we realize plants have got life, but plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing an animal is a bigger sin as compared to killing a plant. Now science has further advanced and we have come to know that even the plants can feel pain. Though we cannot hear the cry of the plant, but even the plants can feel pain. They don't have a very well-developed system, but they can feel pain. And there was a research in America that a farmer had made a gadget where you could make the cry of the plant be heard to the human ear. Because the human ear only hears between 20 cycles to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above this, the human being can't hear. Like this is below 20 cycles, I can't hear. If I do fast, I can hear because it's above 20 cycles. You know the dogs, they can hear up to 40,000 cycles per second. So you may have heard about the silent dog whistle. You blow the whistle, the frequency is between 20,000 and 40,000 cycles per second. The human beings can't hear, the dog here and comes to the master. So the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human being. So there was a research done in America where a farmer makes a gadget and whenever the plant wanted more water, it would cry out, he used to convert the cry and he could hear it. So today, science tells us that even the plants can feel pain. So now, there is a non-Muslim argument to Maxim said, okay, but Zakir, I agree with you, the plants have got life, the plants can feel pain, but you know, plants have got about two senses less as compared to animals. You know, animals have got five senses, plants have got three senses. So I say, okay, for sake of argument, I agree with you. The plants have got three senses, animal has got five senses. So I ask him the question, that suppose if you have a brother, who's born deaf and dumb. And if someone comes and kills him, will you go and tell the judge, me Lord, give this murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less? In fact, you'll go and tell the judge, give this murderer double punishment. My brother was masoom, could not hear, could not speak. Give him double punishment. So where is the logic, two senses less, so less punishment? In Islam, it does not work two senses less or two senses more. Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 168, eat of the things which are good and halal for you. What is permitted and what is good you can have. So what is halal, what is lawful, and what is permitted and what is good you can have. As far as non-Muslims who are against eating non-veg, you know, if I agree that, fine, we should not kill any animals, you know, the population of the cattle, it grows so fast that if we stop eating animals, there'll be overpopulation of cattle in the world. You know, now we have overpopulation of human beings in some countries, India, China, we'll have problems with overpopulation of cattle. And personally, if non-Muslims don't have non-veg, I've got no problem. Believe me, I've got no problem. Because if in India, all the non-Muslims start having non-veg, then maybe the price of mutton and beef will go up. So for me, no problem. If they don't have non-veg, I've got no problem. But if someone tells me that eating non-veg is haram, it's a sin, that's the time I give all this logical explanation. The ninth most common misconception asked is that non-Muslims say, we don't have any problem that Muslims have non-veg food, but why do the Muslims slaughter the animals so ruthlessly? No, Zabiha, slowly you torture and kill the animals, slowly and steadily, you are ruthless people. So once there was a Muslim who was having an argument with a Sikh. In India, we have Sikhs, those who wear the turban. So the Sikh was telling, you Muslims are ruthless, you are merciless. Why do you torture the animal? One jhatka, fatak, an animal dies. So the Muslim told him that you Sikhs, you all are cowards. You all attack the animal from behind. We are mart ka bacha, we are masha, we attack from the front. This is his hikmah. This is not the reason why we do zabiha. It is his hikmah. He had no argument, so he said, we are mart ka bacha, masho. We attack from the front. We all are cowards, we attack from behind. The real logical scientific reason is that why do we do zabiha? Why do we slaughter in the Islamic method? In the Islamic method of slaughtering, the knife should be very sharp. It should be swift, so animals feel the least pain. Secondly, we cut the throat, the windpipe, and the vessels of the neck. 
without damaging the spinal cord. If the spinal cord is damaged, the nerve going to the heart can be severed, they can be cardiac arrest. That is the reason the spinal cord should not be cut. We only cut the throat, the windpipe and the vessels of the neck and let the heart beat. When the heart beats, majority of the blood flows out of the body of the animal. Today, science tells us that blood is a very good medium of germs, bacteria and toxins. So when we let the blood flow out of the animal's body, what are we doing? We are cleansing the animal. We are removing the germs, bacteria and toxins. It's more hygienic. Furthermore, an animal slaughtered by the Islamic method of Zabiya remains fresh for a longer time as compared to an animal slaughtered by the stunning method. Because there's less blood in the animal, it remains fresh for a longer time. Furthermore, people have a misconception. People think that in the Islamic method of slaughtering, the animal dies of pain. Today, science tells us that when we slaughter, when we cut the throat, the windpipe and the vessels of the neck, the nerve supply going to the brain is also cut, which is responsible for feeling of pain. So the animal does not die of pain, the animal dies a peaceful death. Unlike in stunning, many a time the animal dies after hours together. So the Islamic method is the most peaceful method. And the animal dies a peaceful death. The animal kicks and rithers, not because of pain, because the muscles are contracting and relaxing so that the blood can flow out of the body. Animal rithers because of the flow of blood, not because of pain. So the Islamic method of slaughtering is the most hygienic and the best and the humane way of killing. The tenth most common question is, or the misconception about Islam is, that non-Muslims, many of them say, you Muslims, you eat animals, and you behave like animals, violent and ferocious. You Muslims, you know, you all have non-veg food, and you behave like animals, violent and ferocious. I have to agree. Today, science does tell us that what you eat has an effect on your behavior. And I agree with them, that what you eat has an effect on your behavior. That's the reason we Muslims, we are not allowed to eat ferocious and violent animals like tiger, leopard, lion, which are ferocious. We are only allowed to eat the peaceful animals like cow, goat, sheep, because we are peace-loving. The herbivores, animals, the peaceful, you know, we say, Allah mein ki gai hai. In Hindi, we say. We are only allowed to eat the peaceful animals, the cattle. Quran says in Surah Araf, Chapter number seven, verse number 157. The prophet commands you that which is just and prohibits you that which is evil. He allows you that which is lawful and good and prohibits you that which is bad and impure. Allah repeats the message in Surah Hashar, chapter 59, verse number seven. Take what the prophet assigns to you and abstain from that which the prophet prohibits to you. So whatever Allah and his Rasul prohibit, we Muslim abstain from it. And there are various Sahih Hadith in Bukhari, in Muslim, Ibn Majah that speak about the prohibition of these violent animals, these carnivorous animals. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim in the book of Hunting and Slaughtering, Hadith number 4752. Also in Ibn Majah, chapter number 13, Hadith number 3232 and 3234. The various types of food that the Prophet has prohibited. Amongst them is animals that have carnivorous set of teeth, the carnivorous animals that belong to the cat family, like lion, tiger, cat, dog, wolf, hyenas, all these are prohibited. Certain rodents like mice, rats, rabbits with claws, certain reptiles like snakes, alligators, all these are prohibited. The Prophet also prohibited birds which have talons and claws like vultures, eagles, crow, owls, etc. All these are prohibited. Now we'll discuss the 11th most common question asked by the non-Muslim is, the 11th misconception in the mind of the non-Muslim is that if Islam is against idol worship, why do the Muslims bow down to the Kaaba? The reply to the allegation is 
no Muslim ever worshipped the Kaaba. Kaaba is the Qibla, is the direction. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 144. That wherever you are, bow in the direction of the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla. For example, if the Muslim want to offer Salah here, some will say less face, north, some will say south, some will say east, some will say west. So for congregation, for unity, all the Muslims face towards one direction, that is the Kaaba. So Kaaba is our Qibla. And the Muslims, they were the first people who drew the world map. And al udrusi in 1154, was the first human being who drew the world map. And when the Muslims drew the world map, they had the South Pole on top, North Pole down, and Kaaba in the center. Later on, the Western cartographers came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole top, South Pole down, yet, Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba is in the center. So whichever part of the world you are, and if you are in the north, you face towards the south. If you are in the south, you face towards the north. If you are in the east, you face towards the west. If you are in the west, you face towards the east. Kaaba is the center. Now, when we Muslims go to Makkah, and during Umrah, or Hajj, or while doing Tawaf, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. Now, why do the Muslims circumambulate around the Kaaba? Because it's the commandment of Allah and our Rasul, we do it. But the logical reason that I can think of is that when we circumambulate, we know that every circle has got only one center. So when we're circumambulating, we're testifying that God is only one. Furthermore, the statement of the second Caliph of Islam, Hadrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, an, he said it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, chapter number 56, hadith number 675. Hadrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, pointing at the black stone, Hajj Aswad, this black stone can neither benefit me, can neither cause me any harm. Only because I've seen the Prophet kiss it, that's the reason I'm kissing it. This statement that the black stone, Hajj Aswad, can neither benefit any Muslim nor harm any human being is sufficient to prove that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. And furthermore, during the time of the Prophet, there were many Sahabas who stood on the Kaaba and they gave the Azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol he or she worships. This is sufficient proof to show that we Muslims, we don't worship the Kaaba, the Kaaba is only the Qibla. The twelfth most common question asked by non Muslim is that if Islam is a universal religion, then why aren't non Muslims allowed to enter Makkah and Medina? If Islam is a religion for everyone, then why aren't the non Muslims allowed to enter Makkah and Medina? The reply to this question is every country has certain areas which are called as cantonment area. Cantonment area means only the military and the people who are involved in the defense of the country are allowed. Though I am a citizen of India, I am not permitted to go in the cantonment area. I cannot say, I am a citizen of India, why am I not allowed to go in the cantonment area? No. Only those who are involved with the defense and the protection of the country, they are allowed to go in the cantonment area. Similarly, Makkah and Medina, both the Harmain, they are the cantonment areas of Islam. So only those who believe, love, and are willing to die for Islam are allowed to enter Makkah and Medina. That's the reason Allah says in the Quran, from this day, do not allow any non-Muslim to enter in these two areas. Once Allah has prohibited, we agree with it. The other reason is that whenever you enter a country, whenever you want to visit a country, you have to first obtain the visa. No visa, you cannot enter the country. And one of the most difficult countries to get visa is USA. So they ask you so many questions. And nowadays they ask you, are you a terrorist? <laughs> As though anyone will write yes. I want to ask the American government, has anyone written yes? Do you belong to any terrorist organization? Ajib. <laughs> I want to ask them, has anyone written yes? So far, yes, I'm a terrorist. Yes, I belong to terrorist organization. They have so many questions. So you have to fulfill the requirement, otherwise they won't give you visa. And I had gone to Singapore the first time in 1986. And it was mentioned in the immigration form. 
death to drug traffickers. Means if you're caught with drugs, death penalty. You can't say, oh, death penalty, very barbaric law. If you want to enter Singapore, you agree with the law, otherwise don't enter. So if you want to get the visa, you have to agree with the law of the land. Now, the visa to enter Makkah and Medina is to say with your lips, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If any human being says with his lips, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, he can get visa to enter Makkah and Medina. These two holy places are a cantonment area and the visa is to agree there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Due to time limitations, I'll just give the reply to one more misconception or one more common question. Then we can have the common question from this audience, inshallah. At least I'm touching more than 50%. The 13th most common question today, according to me, is that why does Islam prohibit a Muslim from eating pork, the flesh of swine? The answer to this question is, Quran says in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 173. Surah Maida, chapter five, verse number three. Surah Anam, chapter six, verse number 145. And Surah Nihal, chapter 16, verse 115. Wama ulla li gari labi. Forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So there are no less than four different places where it says, that eating the flesh of swine is prohibited. Quran says that we Muslims believe. This prohibition is also mentioned in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. The flesh of swine is unclean. Though it has cloven foot and divided hoof, it chews not the cud. Its flesh is unclean. Thou shalt not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. That means the Bible says eating the flesh of swine is prohibited, even touching it is prohibited. The same message repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, that the swine, though it has divided hoof, it chews not the cud. Its flesh is unclean for you, its carcass should not be touched. The same message repeated in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5, that you should not have the flesh of swine. So according to the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures, eating pork is prohibited. If you read the Hindu scriptures, even in Hindu scriptures, eating pork is prohibited. It's mentioned in Manu Smithi that a Brahmin, a twice born, should not eat cock or onion or dung heap pig. It's further mentioned in Vishnu Shutra. Anyone who sells the meat the forbidden meat, that is pork, you should chop off the opposite hands and limbs. Punishment. It's not there in the Quran and Hadith, Hindu scriptures. Chopping off the hands, if you sell pork. Let us analyze what are the logical reasons. So according to the religious scriptures, whether it be Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, it's clearly mentioned in all these scriptures that eating the flesh of swine is prohibited. Let us analyze what are the logical reasons and scientific reasons for the prohibition of eating of pork. Today, medical science tells us that if a person has pork, he has chances of having no less than 70 different diseases. Pinworm, roundworm, hookworm, you name it, it is there. Many helminths. One of the most dangerous helminths is called as tinea solium. Tinea solium, in layman's terminology, it is tapeworm. And it harbors in the intestine. It's very long. And the eggs, the ova, via the bloodstream, can enter different organs of the body. If it goes to the brain, it can cause memory loss. If it goes to the eye, it can cause blindness. If it goes to the heart, it can cause heart attack. If it goes to the liver, it can cause liver damage. It can damage almost all the organs of the body. And by the time you realize you're suffering from this, Tinea solium, it's already too late. The other dangerous disease is, if a person has pork, is trichuria trichuriasis. And many people have a misconception that when you cook your food very well, these helminths die. According to a research, out of 24 people suffering from trichuria trichuriasis, 22 have cooked the food well. 
That means the food that you cook in your house, the normal temperature you reach cannot kill the germs and bacteria and the ova that are there in the pork. There are various other reasons why a person should not have pork. Today, science tells us that eating pork has got fat building material. It has very little muscle building material. Because of the fat building material, person has high chances of having hypertension, atherosclerosis, heart attacks. That's the reason more than 50% of the Americans, they suffer from hypertension because most of them are pig eaters. Today we know that one of the most filthiest animals on the face of the earth is the pig. Wherever you find feces, muck, filth, you'll find the pig there. It is the most dirtiest animal. Some people say, in certain countries like Australia, I know, they breed the pig very well, you know, very hygienic. I tell them, even in Australia, in the sty, the pigs are kept together. You know the pig, when it excretes, it eats its own excreta. So do you have man 24 hours manning wherever he excretes, he picks up the excreta? No. So even in Australia, the pig is dirty. It's one of the most filthiest animals. And one more reason I can think of besides many is that today science tells us pig is the most shameless animal on the face of the earth. It is the only animal that invites its friends to see when it's having sex with its mate. When the pig is having sex with its mate, it invites its friends to see him having sex with the mate. You know, in America, modern society, they have dance parties. After the dance parties, they're swapping of wives. You sleep with my wife, I sleep with your wife. You eat pig, you behave like pigs. <laughs> Due to limitation of time, I will not be able to complete all the 20 common questions, but you're most welcome to go to the website www.irf.net and get all the answers in details. I would like to leave the rest of the time for the open question answer session. I'd like to end the speech with the verse of the Quran of Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, Wakul jal haq wa zaqal batil. Innal batil zauka. When truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Waqhur dawana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Zakir Naik, for a very profound, informative, and an enlightening talk. Now, we move on to a very interesting part of this program, the open question and answer session. To analyze the topic, misconceptions about Islam, adequately for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following guidelines to be followed during the question and answer session. Questions asked, should be on the topic. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general question on religion, will not be allowed. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you will have to go back of the row again and await your second chance to ask your question. Non-Muslim brothers and sisters will be given first preference to ask the question. Three mics have been provided for the questions from the audience in the auditorium. The first mic on my left. The second in the middle aisle for the gents. The third mic in the ladies section. Please stand in a queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker and speak into the mic only when the mic handling assistants hand over the mic to you. We will allow one question at each of the mics in clockwise rotation. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forth your question. May we begin the first question. Brother, please state your name and profession before you pose your question. Uh, I'm Dr. Chabra. I'm an eye specialist. I'm in Dubai since 1984. I had a chance to listen to Dr. Zagir a few times, and it's always fun to listen to him every time. He's so informative, so educative, so eye-opener, 
and I always enjoy asking him some questions. So I'm lucky to be the first to ask him the question. My first question is, you said the holy place is in the center so that it is equal from everywhere. But to my mind, I may be wrong or right, the God is all-prevailing, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnivorous. Then he need not to be present in one place. He is everywhere. Well, non-Muslim brothers asked a good question. And I enjoyed hearing my talk, I enjoyed asking questions. And I enjoy answering your question, brother. He asked the question that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, so why should he be in the center? Brother, when you heard my answer, I think you misunderstood. I never said God is present in the center. I didn't say that. I said the Kaaba is in the center, not God. Kaaba is the Qibla, the direction. And the Kaaba is only direction for unity. When we worship Almighty God, we face in one direction for unity. Not that God is only there. Quran clearly says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 177, it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east and west. It is righteousness that you believe in Allah. So you misunderstood. Kaaba is the Qibla direction. So for unity, they have kept the direction in the center. God is not in the center. God is on the arsh. He is on the throne. What we realize that for unity, we have to face in one direction. So the Kaaba for unity has been kept in the center. So all the different people, different human beings from different parts of the world can face for unity in one direction because we believe when we offer prayers in Salah, we believe in congregation, believe in unity. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you very much. Can we have the next question from the lady's side? I'd request that if there are any non-Muslims, they're most welcome to come on the microphone. This is the opportunity. You can ask any questions on Islam, on comparative religion, even if it's criticism, even if it's attacking Islam, attacking Quran, I can take it, I'm young. No problem. So any non-Muslims have any questions, any clarification, not that you have to agree with everything what I say. If you think I said something wrong, you're most welcome to correct me. If I'm wrong, I'll correct myself or I will clarify your misconception. This is the opportunity. It's not common that you have open question and session after religious talk. Very few times you have. This is the opportunity. We give more time for question and answer session. You can clarify your misconception. What you agree, no problem. What you disagree, you can clarify. This is the opportunity. The non-Muslim would be given the first preference. So I request all the non-Muslims to come on the microphone, the three microphones for the gents on the right, on the left, also for the gents, and one behind for the ladies there. Please come on the microphone. You can break the queue and come in the front. Yes, sister, most welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Amuta. I'm working in Indian Embassy. So I just want, I have a lot of questions, but for time being, I'm saying little bit questions. So in Islam, why there is no caste system? Yes, sister. Okay, my second question sister, is... Sister, ask the first question. After okay. I reply, then you can ask the second question. <laughs> okay, fine. Give me the answer. Sister, ask the question, why in Islam there's no caste system? Because in Islam, we believe that all the human beings are equal. Unlike in Hinduism. Okay. Quran says, Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13. Ya inna wa unsa wa ja'alnakum wa qaba'ila litarafu. Inna in the law yatkakum. Inna la alimun khabir. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. And have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person as taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God for a human being to be superior to the other human being, it's not sex, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not age, but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it is piety, it is righteousness. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being, it's not by wealth, it's not by age, it's not by sex, but it's by piety, it's by God consciousness, it's by righteousness. Unlike Hinduism, when we read the Vedas, it's mentioned that Almighty God, He created the Brahmin class, the learned class from the head. That's the first caste. Then He created the warrior class, the Kshatriyas, from the chest. Then from His stomach and thighs, 
he created the business community, the Vaishyas. And from the feet, he created the Shudras, that is the untouchables, that is the lower caste. So this is what is mentioned in the Vedas. In Islam, we believe that all the human beings are equal. We don't believe that one human being is superior to the other human being because of birth, because of profession, because of wealth, because of color, because of caste. So Islam is a universal religion. Unlike in the Vedas, what they say that you have to stick to your profession. Because it was mainly controlled by the Brahmins, which is again small percentage, minute percentage. And they say that if you are born as a Shudra, you remain a Shudra, you serve the Brahmin, next life maybe you may become a better person. No, this is all ideology. So that you know they want to keep the person low, person will remain low and the rich and the top people remain top. In Islam we believe in equality. And Islam is a religion for all the human beings. That is the reason Islam is against caste system. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, sir, I have one more doubt. So, why you are saying uh, the Muslim is Sayyid Muslim or Sunni Muslim or Shia? So, what is that? Sister said that, why am I saying Sayyid Muslim and Shia Muslim Sunni? I never said Sayyid Muslim, Shia Muslim. Muslim is the one who submits his will to Almighty God. In Islam, there is no sect. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamia wala tafarraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. There is no Sayyid Muslim and Sunni or this. Yes, the family. Fine, you may belong to a family. You may belong to a Sheikh family. You may belong to Sayyid family. To know your roots, that does not mean a person is superior, a Khan is superior to a Sheikh or a Sayyid. No. It is belonging to your roots. Like how you may come from some family so that you have come from particular land or particular area, if you have come from Kokan region. So this is family background. It doesn't mean one person is superior to the other. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being is by piety, is by righteousness, is by God consciousness. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, second question. Why in Islam Allah says no horoscope is seen? Sister asked the question that why in Islam during marriages no horoscope is seen? Because sister, we don't believe in horoscope. Why there is no date of birth? Based on the date of birth, you are not seeing any horoscope? Yes, sister, I'll come to it. I will tell you what Hinduism says, because I studied Hinduism. In Hinduism, they believe in horoscope. Kundali, Kundali. You know Kundali? It's called Kundli. Yes, you know, sister. When Kundli, you tell your date of birth, then they say that this sun was there, and this Shagun, and this, this Grahan came. This is a science. But this science is not established science. It's a hypothesis. It says that if you are born on this date, then this Grahan comes, and this planet goes there, and this. It is a science, but it's not an established science. It's not hard science, like what we read in our college, biology, physiology, embryology, it is what they believe, it's an assumption. And then they talk about future, everything what they mention in the Kundli does not come out to be true. We in Islam are against fortune telling. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya Ladina Amanu, inna mal khamru al maisuru. Oh, you believe, most certainly intoxicant and gambling, wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich summin amili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First, then you will come to Flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Quran says, this fortune telling, divination of arrows, they are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. So in Islam, we do not believe in this. Many a time, you go in a machine, you put your date of birth, then it comes out there. Something good is going to happen to you in the next one week. Even if 100 bad things happen, one good thing will surely happen. The next person goes, it comes horoscope, something bad is going to happen in the next one month. So these are statements that are made which are so ambiguous. And all this, you know, parrot goes and picks up, a parrot goes and picks up a chit, and you come to know your kundali or what your future. So in Islam, we don't believe a parrot can pick up and tell you what is your future, or by reading the palm, or looking at the stars. Islam is against this. And many a time, you get fooled into believing that it is true. And there was a research done that once a psychologist, he was teaching a class, class of 100 students. 
And after one week, he said, now I have understood your background, everything. I will write about each individual person, about his past and everything. But don't open the chit until I tell you. So he wrote to all 100 students details about the past. Then he said, okay, now open the chits and give me gradation. How much am I accurate? Believe me. More than 95% of the students said the professor was more than 90% correct. The secret was the professor wrote the same thing for everyone. These are such ambiguous statements. What we have to realize is that Islam is against fortune telling, against knowing about the future. That's the reason there's no kundli required. If the kundli was there, yet we find that so many marriages are being broken in Hinduism. Why? What we believe that we have to choose our life partner. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith, that whenever you choose your life partner, you look for four things. Beauty, wealth, nobility, and virtue. The best is virtue. The best to choose from a life partner is a virtuous life partner, not Kundali. Whether born in October, September, doesn't make a difference. The virtue should match. That is the reason a woman in Islam, sister, is called as a Mohsena. Mohsena in Arabic means a fortress against the devil. In other religions, including Hinduism, the woman is referred as an instrument of a devil. In Quran, the woman is referred as a Mohsena. In Arabic, it means a fortress against the devil. So if you marry a virtuous woman, inshallah, she will prevent the husband from going in the wrong track. Hope that answers the question, sister. Shall I ask the third question? Sister, let's give a chance. When the chance comes to you, you can answer. Okay, thank no problem. So you can stand there. We'll ask the other non-Muslims. We'll allow them to give a question. If any other non-Muslims come, give them a chance. Then you can ask sister. So that we give everyone equal opportunity. Yes, brother. I have a question yes. that uh, how can you convince a Sikh about Islam based on the comparison between the Guru Granth Sahib and the Quran? Furthermore, did you encounter any contradictions in the Guru Granth Sahib, when you read it, when you read it and understood it. My brother who asked two questions yesterday night is a job seeker. I think you're a truth seeker. Huh? <laughs> he asked that, can you compare, when you compare Sikhism, Guru Granth Sahib, what are the similarities you found? And did you find any differences in Sikhism? I did mention some points yesterday that as far as Sikhism, I told you yesterday that it was a religion of 10 Gurus and was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib and the 10th Guru was Guru Gobind Sahib. It originated towards the end of the 15th century in the land of Punjab, the land of Five Rivers. And Guru Nanak was very much influenced. He belonged to a Kshatriya family and was influenced by the Muslims. Therefore, you find many of the teachings are quite common and scholars say it's an amalgamation of Islam and Hinduism. As far as the teachings are concerned, the basic Sikh comes from the root word Sisya, means a student, a seeker, a seeker of truth. Therefore, I told you, you are a seeker of truth, not a job seeker. And in Arabic, we say Talib, you know Talib. Talib means a student, person who does Talab, who seeks. As far as the five Ks a Sikh is supposed to maintain in Sikhism, he has to maintain his Kesh, that uncut hair. He has to have a kanga, a comb, to keep his hair clean. He has to wear a kala, a bracelet, a metal bracelet. He has to keep a kirpan, a dagger. I don't know whether they have one. No. The Dubai police won't allow you here. Huh? <laughs> and the fifth is the kacha, the underdogs, the long underdogs. So these are the five Ks that a Sikh should maintain. If you ask me similarities, some are right. Even the Prophet said that, you know, we have to keep an arm, it's sunnah. Therefore, when you go to Oman, most of the Omani has a dagger. Like the Sikh, Oman, you saw the Omani. So, you know, because they said sunnah, fine. A Prophet said that you be prepared, always have a weapon, help you in self-defense. So it's matching. Though it's not a fard, it is sunnah. In Sikhism, it's a fard. So that's the difference is there. As far as uncut hair, our religion doesn't say that you should cut or should not cut. So there are many teachings which are similar. Some are different, some are optional. As far as I told you yesterday, that regarding the basic concept of God, I feel it is almost similar. The concept of God in Sikhism 
and the concept of God in Islam is almost similar. And as I told you yesterday, that the first verse of the Guru Granth Sahib, Adi Granth, that is the Japuji, first volume, first verse says that the God is true. He is the creator, the unbegotten, free from fear and want, great, compassionate. This is similar to the concept of God in Islam, of Surah class. And Sikhism is a monotheistic religion, which believes in one God. It is against Autarvada. It does not believe in idol worship. And in the unmanifest form, Almighty God is called as Ek Omkara, and manifest form as Omkara. And there are various attributes, what I mentioned yesterday of the similarities. Many attributes given to Almighty God in the Guru Granth Sahib and Sikhism is the same as in Islam. Almighty God is called as Akal, that's eternal. He is called as Sahib, that's Lord. He is called as Kartar, that is Creator. He is called as Parvardigar, that's the Cherisher. He is called as Rahim, the Merciful. He is called as Kareem, the Beneficent. He is also called as Vahe Guru, the One True God. Now, what we realize as far as Sikhism is concerned, as I mentioned, it's an amalgamation, as the scholars say, of Hinduism and Islam. There are many points which are similar. What is not there, because it's a religion that came after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's one of the new religions. There are very few religions that came after it. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So therefore, it does not mention about the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All the other religious scriptures that you find, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, they mention about the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, Sikhism, because it's a new religion, it came after the demise of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no mention that I came across about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As far as Islam is concerned, the basic two points to be noted. After believing that there's only one God who deserves worship and obedience, besides that, we also have to believe in the last and final message of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Though Guru Nanak did respect Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did praise him, but I don't know of any scripture where he mentioned him as the messenger. So this is one point which I feel is which is then the other scriptures of the other religions. Where it's clearly mentioned, besides believing in one God, besides believing in Tawheed, about the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is not mentioned in the six scriptures. And the practice of Sikhism has deviated and have gone on the wrong track, as I said, that they worship the Guru Granth Sahib, the Adi Granth, which was not told by Guru Nanak. Neither worshipping the fire has been told. So what we realize is that all these are interpolations that have come. And many of the acts of Hinduism have crept into Sikhism. And that's how you have a different religion. But what we say Quran is the Furqan, is the criteria to judge right from wrong. Whatever matches with the Quran, we say we have no objection accepting as the word of God. Which contradicts, we say is wrong. What does not match and does not contradict, we say maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Hope that answers the question well. Shall we have the next question from the brother's side in the middle of the aisle? Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Zakir Naik, and to one and all. My name is Srinil Patne, and uh, we have a family uh, restaurant business. Well, my question is, as we all know, God is the Almighty, the one and all. If he's, uh, sorry, he or she, I wouldn't genderize him. If God is so powerful, why doesn't he come down himself or clear all the sins in this world? Make it the perfect place to be in. Why does it have to take so much of time? Like, as we all know, there is hell and there is heaven. Uh, the people who do good deeds go to heaven and the people who do bad deeds go to hell. He's testing us. Why does it take God 6,000 years to test us? Brother, that's a very good question. That why isn't God so powerful that he can come down and clear all the misconceptions? Why is it taking... 6,000 years or more to test us. It's a very good question. And Quran says that if Almighty God wanted, He could have made everyone as Muslims. Quran says in many places. That means He could have made everyone believe in Almighty God. But the Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allazi khalaqal wal hayata. It's Almighty God has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. It's like you telling me that we have gone to school 
after 10 years, we appear for board examination. SSC board, CBSC, IGCSC. Now, why is the teacher taking test? Why doesn't teacher pass everyone? <laughs> if teacher passes everyone, everyone will get admission to medical college. And everyone will become doctors, and they start killing people rather than curing. So in the medical examination, you say, why is our medical teacher failing us? He's failing us to know whether you're worth treating a patient or not. So similarly, Almighty God has created the human beings and have given the human beings a free will. All the other creations of Almighty God don't have free will, except the human beings and jinn have free will. The angels have no free will. Whatever God says, they follow 100%. But the human being is a superior creation than the angels. After Almighty God has given us a free will, then if we obey the commandment of God, we are superior than the angels. If we don't obey His commandments, we are inferior to the angels. So now, Almighty God has given us a free will. And before we came in this world, Almighty God asked us, who would like to become a human being? If you don't become a human being, you have just passed. You may either become mountain, they are Muslim, tree, they are Muslim, animals, they are Muslims, angels, they are Muslim. Muslim means submitting the will to God. All the animals are Muslims. All the stars are Muslims. All the plants are Muslims. All the angels are Muslims. Now, human being is a unique creation. It is the best creation of Almighty God. So God asked, who would like to become a human being? The Quran says, we human beings were fools who said we want to become human beings. That means, just pass, or if you become a human being, you may get distinction. All of us thought we'll get distinction. How many gates will come down afterwards? So we have been given the free will. And now we are undergoing the test. So if Almighty God passes everyone, then I will say Almighty God is unjust. If Almighty God puts everyone in heaven, then I will I was such a good man, I did not rob, I was honest. That man, robber, rapist, even he's with me in heaven. I will object to Almighty God. Why did you put this person in heaven? So Almighty God, the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 40, He is never unjust in the least degree. So therefore, Almighty God is merciful. He gives us a chance. He forgives us. But finally, He is also just. So based on this, we are undergoing this test. This life is a test for the hereafter. So we are a unique creation of Almighty God. And the purpose of this creation, as the Quran says, in Surah Darya, chapter 51, verse 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That Almighty God has created the jinn and the human beings not but to worship Him. By worshipping Him, that means obeying His commandments. If we obey His commandments, we pass in this test. Otherwise, the Quran says, if He wanted, He could have made all the human beings Muslims very easy for Him. But we are a better creation, a unique creation. If we obey Him, after free will is given, we are superior. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you. Shall we ask the next question from the sister's side? Good evening, Dr. Zakir. My name is Jal, and I work here for Emirates Bank International. My question to you is, which other religion says that they are awaiting the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, other than Muslim and Christianity? Sister asked the question that which other religion besides Islam and Christianity says that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu will come. Sister, besides the religion of Christianity and Islam, most, if not all, most of the religions that came before Islam prophesied about coming of the last and final messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've given a talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the various world religious scriptures. Besides Christianity, you also find in Judaism about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18 about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Christianity is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 26. Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse number 7. Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. There are many verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament prophesying about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Since your name is Jal, and I assume you're a Hindu sister, correct? Yes. I've even given the talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hindu scriptures. I can give a talk for a few hours. 
only on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Hindu scriptures. Time will not permit me to go into it. I'll just give the references. If you read the Hindu scriptures, the Hindu scriptures are of two types. One is Smriti, the other is Shruti. Shruti means the word of God, in which you have Vedas and the Upanishad. Smriti is the word of human being, in which you have Manu Smriti, you have Ramayan, Mahabharat, epics, etc. You also have the Puranas. If you read Bhavishya Purana, it's mentioned Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, which speaks about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 10 to 27, talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the Malaysia. He is mentioned in, he is mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6. Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7. He is also mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, verse 1 to 14, which is called as Kuntap Suktas. Kuntap means hitting. It speaks about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he will be the praiseworthy, he will have 60,000 enemies, etc. He is also mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, chapter number 53, verse number 9. He is mentioned as Ahmad, which means one who praises in Uttar Chik, mantra number 1500. It's mentioned in Indra, chapter number 2, verse number 152. Jajur Ved, chapter number 31, verse number 18. He's also mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 126, verse number 1 to 14. He is called as Nara Shansa. Nar means man, person. Shansa means coming from Prashansa, praiseworthy. A man who's praiseworthy. If you translate Narashansa, man who's praiseworthy into Arabic, it means Muhammad Sallallahu Sallam. He's prophesied as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 13, verse number three. In Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 64, verse number three. He's mentioned Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number three, verse number five. Rig Ved, book number five, hymn number five, verse number two. He's also mentioned Jajur Ved, chapter number 20, verse 37. Jajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 31. I can go on and on and on mentioning only the references of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in Hindu scriptures. Due to limitation of time, I will just touch on one prophecy a little bit in more detail. He has been prophesied as the Kalki Autar. You know, when you read the Kalki Purana, book number 2, verse number 5, 7, 9, 11, 14, he is prophesied as the Kalki Autar. And it's mentioned there that his father's name will be Vishnu Yas. Vishnu means God, Yas means servant, servant of God. If you translate to Arabic, it's Abdullah, the father of the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abdullah. His mother's name will be Sumati. Sumati means serenity, peaceful. If you translate to Arabic, it means Amina. The name of the mother of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Amina. It says he will be born in a city by the name Sambala. Sambala means a place of peace and serenity. That is Makkah. He'll be born in the house of the chief of the village of Sambala. He was born in the house of Quraysh. It says he will be born on the 12th. You clap at every point, it will go on for hundreds of claps, mashallah. <laughs> he'll be born on the 12th month of Madhav. That the 12th Rabbi Awal. It says that he will be a teacher for the whole of humanity. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to the mercy of the whole of humanity. It says he'll get the first revelation in a cave known as Gare Hira. It says he will migrate northwards and come back. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went from Makkah to Medina northwards and came back. It says that he'll be given eight supernal qualities. It says that he'll have four companions talking about the first four Khulfar Rashidin. It says that he'll be helped with the angels in the battlefield. We know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held in the battle of Badr with angels. I can go on and on talking only about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you're a Hindu and if you believe in the Hindu scriptures, you also have to believe the last and final avatar, the last and final messenger in Hinduism is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. However, doctor, uh, according to Hinduism, the Kalki Avatar is still being awaited. So are you, uh, is it that if we, you are, have we not, are just not aware about it? You said the Kalki Avatar is yet awaited. If you have not recognized the Kalki Avatar, you are to blame, not me. I have given yes. you so many similarities. Now you have to disprove it. You say, my scripture says Vishnu Yas, father's name. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father's name was not Vishnu Yas. You have to disprove me. Now this has been done by pundits of Hinduism. Hindu scholars have also written this. 
now the hindu scholars are preventing the truth from you they are hiding the truth from you you as a logical girl as intelligent girl who is working in a high post it's your duty to realize that if your priest are hiding the truth from you we can have a debate with your priest you can call the doctors of divinity you know i have had dialogues with pandits you know one of the very famous shri shri ravi shankar he never disagreed he agreed he agreed with what i said about oneness of almighty god has got no images he believed in prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did not accept that's a different thing because he will lose his following therefore says do you have a following so you have no fear to lose the following so when i've given you so many references with giving quotations i'm not pulling a fast one you can very well go and check and verify but after you verify do you accept in the last and final messenger do you yes so do you believe in prophet muhammad peace yes. be upon him mashallah do you believe that there's one god yes i do do you believe almighty god has got no images yes i do so you believe there's god and he has no images yes and do you believe prophet muhammad is the messenger of god yes i do then you're a muslim sister <laughs> what you said is the shahada in english do you want to repeat in arabic if you want sister what you said is in english that there's no god but allah and prophet muhammad is the messenger would you like to repeat in arabic sister i do okay i'll just repeat it and you have to continue sister ashhadu ashhadu allah allah ilaha ilaha illa allah illa allah wa ashhadu wa ashhadu anna anna muhammadan muhammadan abduhu ablu wa rasuluhu wa rasulu i be Mashallah sister May Allah Mash Mashallah sister may Allah reward you you have joined a family of religion of peace of more than 1.3 to 1.5 billion may Allah reward you and may allah grant you jannah inshallah and believe me sister require guts i feel that mashallah i really admire your guts more than shishi ravi shankar mashallah and i pray that may give you hidayah and may guide you inshallah and sister if you have any questions any queries there are local organizations in dubai who can surely clarify your misconceptions to understand islam look at the quran and the sahih hadith they are the best guides if you have any queries you can even write to the email at islam@irf.net it may pleasure to reply and do pray for me also sister the next question from the brother side good morning tayo doctor i am mr alan singko my question is i want to embrace and accept islam so what can i do to become islam mashallah our filipino our filipino brother mashallah may allah accept his effort he wants to accept islam in islam if you accept islam you only have to believe that there's no god but allah and prophet muhammad is a messenger do you believe that there's one god yes brother do you believe that no one deserves worship besides almighty god allah yes i do do you believe that prophet muhammad is a messenger of allah yes i believe so i'll just say in arabic repeat it then we'll say the translation inshallah okay ashhadu ashhadu allah allah ilaha ila illa allah illa allah wa ashhadu wa ashhadu anna anna muhammadan muhammadan abduhu abdu wa rasuluhu wa rasuluhu ma sha allah i bear witness
Mashallah, I'll just... Brother, I'll just repeat, brother, I'll just repeat what you said, the meaning in Arabic. I bear witness. I bear witness. That. That. There is no God. There is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Prophet Muhammad. That Prophet Muhammad. Is. Is. The messenger. The messenger. And servant of God. And the son of God. MashaAllah. This is the translation of what you said. And I'd like to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That mashallah may accept your efforts and it's good mashallah to see that in the city of dubai alhamdulillah that people may have come here for earning a living believe me what you earned here is less than what you'll earn in the akhirah what you learn in the akhirah inshallah will be much more and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you jannah inshallah thank you brother thank you so much shall we proceed to the next question from the brothers yes um yeah my name is rahul I am a telecoms engineer working in Dubai since 2002. I want to ask a few questions. Coming from my background, I think religion is something that following that, you're safe from making, um, having problems in your life, yeah? Um, my first question is, I recently read a report by a doctor saying that because of marriages in first cousins in Islam, it leads to a higher probability of the fetuses being born uh, as handicaps. Yeah? It increases the probability of the babies born without hands or without legs. So if it was something that could potentially cause harm, it should not have been allowed in Islam. Another point to, I would like to add to the same question is, recently I suffered a little bit of a BP, and I went to the doctor, and the first thing he said to me is that stop eating red meat which is again allowed in Islam. So I would uh, think that if these things could be harmful to the human body, these should not have been allowed by who has created us. So if you can clarify me on that. The brother has two questions. The first question that is talking about consanguineous marriages. Consanguineous marriages means marriage between close relatives. In English it's called as consanguineous marriages. And in consanguineous marriages, medical science tells us today, there are high chances of genetic problems. And I do agree with the brother. Yes. So why does Islam permit that? Yes. It's clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 22 to 24, the woman who you can marry and the woman who you cannot marry is mentioned there. Amongst them, it's clearly mentioned you cannot marry your sister and a lady cannot marry the brother. It's mentioned. Neither the father, neither the mother. You cannot marry the brother of your father the ladies, and you cannot marry the sister of your father. That means the important close relatives are mentioned in the Quran. Brother, sister cannot marry, son and mother, father and daughter, paternal uncle, maternal uncle can't marry. But as far as first cousins are concerned, Islam does give permission. Now as far as consanguineous marriages are concerned, the maximum problem comes when you marry your direct blood brother and sister. Consanguineous marriage. Even if you marry your direct father, daughter, mother and son, or your uncle. The chances are also there if you marry your first cousin, but it's negligible, very negligible. So no, it's that's not, not... That's not what the report said. The report said that because of marriages in first cousins, not your brothers and sisters, it let leads me, to this problem. Let and me it was from a doctor. Let, let it me was complete. published in Gulf News as well, actually. Brother, let me complete even I'm a doctor. Ah, okay. Fine. Even I'm a medical doctor. Yeah. It means medical doctor with that doctor. Yeah. The chances in direct relatives are very high. Yeah. If a sister and brother marry, the chances are very high. Yeah. If a father and daughter are very high, you have read only one report, you haven't read the other report. Uh, yeah. So you only read Gulf News, I read medical books. So right. Gulf News is better or medical books, is brother? Right. Which so is your, better? Point is, your point is marrying in first cousins, uh, the lesser, chances of getting lesser, problem is negligible. As compared to Brother and sister. As compared to. Yes, as compared, com compared to. Yeah. Yes, compared but still, but still there is a... Brother, will you let me complete my answer or... Sorry, yeah, please. So you have more faith in Gulf News? No, no, not really. I'm here huh? to find the truth. truth. That's right. <laughs> so what you realize that consanguineous marriage, and I agree with you. I didn't say it's not there. Yeah. So I'm not trying to beat around the bush. But compared, it is negligible. Compared to direct blood brother and sister. Now, mm -hmm. I do agree that there are medical genetic problems in various ways. But 
this report is there when you have continuously generation after generation. According to Dr. Ahmed Sakari says, the Prophet said, do not marry against first cousins generation after generation. Ah, if you do it once or okay. twice, it is no problem. Yet, even if you marry not cousins also, you can get a problem. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. That. Ah, so that doesn't mean that you stop marriage only. Right. So there is a hadith ah. which says yes. that do not do it generation after generation. Yes, but okay. otherwise generally there's no problem. Right. Fine. Okay. Okay. So coming to your second question. Yeah. You went to a doctor and you said you had high BP. Yes. Doctor said you have red meat. Yes. So why does Islam allow red meat? Yes. You know, my friend went to a doctor and doctor said you have diabetes. Don't have sugar. Brother, why do you have sugar? Right. Why? Don't have sugar. My friend went to a doctor. Doctor said you have diabetes. Don't have sugar. Brother, do you have sugar? Yes, of course. Why you have to stop having sugar? Yeah, well, we can live on vegetables, easily possible. Can, can you live, live without having chicken. sugar? Can you live without having sugar? Even vegetarians have sugar, brother. Yeah. Are you educated? Yeah. yeah. MashaAllah. <laughs> the problem is that person had a problem with his pancreas. Yes. In the pancreas, there are islets of linger hand which break down the sugar. Because my friend had a problem in the pancreas, he could not break down the sugar. Therefore, the doctor said, don't have sugar. Right. Well, right. you have some problem of red meat, you should not have red meat. Others can have red meat. Right. <laughs> the Quran right. says, a general statement, Quran says, eat what is halal and tayyab for you. There's a verse in the Quran, eat what is halal and tayyab for you. For a person suffering from diabetes, sugar is not tayyab. So according to the Quran, a person having diabetes should have less sugar. It's a general statement. Eat what is halal and tayyab for you. That means certain things which is good for others may not be good for you. But there are certain things which are bad for everyone. Alcohol. Alcohol is bad for everyone. It is prohibited for everyone. Pork is bad for everyone. Therefore, pork has been prohibited for everyone. What do you realize? Certain food, because of the way your metabolism is made, because it's a problem for you, doesn't mean that everyone should abstain from it. Hope that answers the question. Brother. Sure. Okay. My uh, next question is, um, Islam allows marriages, um, I mean, a husband to marry more than one wife, four wives. Is it um, compulsory to take the permission from the wife before marrying that second one? Because a lot of Muslim girls have told me that, you know, they have to take permission from the first wife, so our interests are taken care of. I hope you don't intend to become a Muslim and marry more than one wife, huh? No, I don't. Because, <laughs> because there's a new law in the Indian government. If a Hindu converts to Muslim and marries more than one wife, then there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. There's a no, new law that's passed. I don't intend to, but I just need to find don't out. Don't intend to marry or don't intend to convert? I, well, I won't answer that now. <laughs> <laughs> the other the question that is it compulsory that a husband should take the permission of his first wife before he marries a second wife? As a general rule, because it is mentioned in the Quran that a man can have more than one wife, it is not required for a man to take the permission of first wife, but it is preferably takes permission or at least informs her. Okay. Yeah. As far as permission, certain conditions become compulsory. During a nikah, during a marital contract, a man or a woman, before they get married, they can put any conditions which are permitted. If the woman puts a condition in the nikah nama that my husband will not take a second wife as long as I live, because marrying more than one wife is optional. So if she puts a condition, then it becomes compulsory for the husband to take the permission of the wife, otherwise he cannot marry. If this is not mentioned in the nikah nama, if it's not mentioned in the marital contract, it's not a must, it is preferable. Okay, Hope that answers okay. the question. Thanks. My last question, this la my last question is... Yeah, brother, you are most welcome. Just stand behind the queue. Okay, there may you. be one or two non-Muslims. You. you can wait, brother. There may be one or two non-Muslims. Just stand behind the non-Muslims and we'll try and give all the non-Muslims the chance. Yes, sister. Yes, sir. I just want to take Shahada. <laughs> MashaAllah. The sister... The sister who asked the question earlier, and I believe you're a Hindu sister? Yeah, I'm Hindu. Yes, the sister who asked the earlier question, Mashallah, Allah gave her hidayat and she wants to accept Islam. I want to ask you, sister, do you believe there is one God? Yeah, I believe in Do you believe God. that Almighty God has got no images? Yes, sir, I believe. Yes, and you believe that there's no one to worship besides Allah? Means? Do you believe that there's no God but Allah? Yeah, I believe Allah is the... Place. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger of this God? Yes, I believe. Inshallah, I'll say in Arabic and you repeat it, sister. Ashadu. Oh.
I'll say in Arabic and repeat this sister slowly. Okay. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abdu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa. Wa rasul. Wa rasulu. Luhu. Mashallah sister. Sister, I'll just say the translation. I'll just mention the translation, sister. You just repeat the translation, which will be much more easier. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness. That. That. There is no God. That there is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad. Is. Is. The messenger. Is the messenger. And servant of Almighty God. And. Servant of. Almighty God. Servant of Almighty God. MashaAllah, sister. You are a Muslim. May Allah smile to reward you. And may Allah grant you Jannah. And sister, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any question, any queries, please don't feel shy. You can contact the local organizations here. If you have any questions, you can even send an email to our organization, islam at irf.net. We have a ladies' wing which takes care of any questions, any queries, any problems you have. And sister, see to it that as you keep on learning whatever about Islam, slowly and steadily. Main thing is Iman believing. The practice keeps on coming slowly and steadily. Whatever you learn, you can ask questions, you can keep on following, and slowly and slowly, inshallah, inshallah, you can keep on following all the trends of Islam. Thank you very much, sister. Sir, is there any organization which can teach me how to pray, how to do all the things? I'm sure there is an organization, Darul Bir. The organization I know in Dubai, Darul Bir, I'm sure there are lady organizations. And I think their sister Yasmin, who is the wife of my friend Brother Najmuddin, surely sister Yasmin would be somewhere in the ladies' wing. They have a ladies' organization. You can contact the volunteer and inshallah they'll help you out in teaching you how to pray, how to offer salah and the other aspects of Islam. Thank you, sister. Yes. Can we have the next question from the brother? Morning, Mr. Zakir Naik. My name is Jamish Damani. First of all, I want to thank you for what you're doing here. I've really taken a, a lot away from here, I'm sure. Um, my question is on your point number three. Actually, I have three questions, if you could be so kind. But on point number three, first of all, I felt that you, it was very evasive, your, your answer. But what I'm going to ask you is very simple. When you talk about terrorism, when you talk about Islam, now this is a very simple straightforward question i hope i can get a straightforward answer with what's happening in pakistan iraq afghanistan just to name a few i'm not stereotyping i hope no one takes offense but when you hear on the news that a woman is cooking food for her kids and then a suicide bomber comes and kills them i want to ask you a simple question what is that is that Islam or is that people who don't understand what Islam is and they have their own perception of Islam? And please, let me ask you one more thing. Can you give me an answer that is not in World War I or something there were more people that died or this is all propaganda and these are Americans killing people and that's well, your not answer, the, then you pass yeah, your comment, inshallah. Yeah, I want your just answer, that type of answer. Yeah. Your answer, then you can pass your comment. Huh? The brother has the question. That years in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, a woman cooking food, a suicide bomber comes and blows up and kills. As far as Islam, what the media is saying, forget about it. I'll give you ruling of Islam. Whether what the media says is right or wrong. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32. If anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Any person kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, Unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if any human being saves other human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. So according to the Quran, killing any single innocent human being is prohibited. If a suicide bomber comes and kills a woman who is cooking she innocent, it is 100% prohibited, whether done in Pakistan or Afghanistan or America or Dubai. Is the answer clear? Okay. 100% wrong. Now. Whoever was doing it, Whoever was doing it, whoever was doing it, whether namesake Muslim or American or propaganda, whoever was doing it, it is totally prohibited. Okay. 
Fine, so is it clear answer? That is clear. Hundred percent clear. Hundred percent. Whether you do, anyone so that does. Is wrong, yeah. Hundred percent okay. wrong. It is no. as though he has killed the whole of humanity. There is no other scripture that I know of today. Okay. There is no other scripture that I know of today yeah. that gives this statement that if you kill one human being, it is as though you killed the whole humanity, except the Quran. There is perfect, no other perfect. scripture that I know which says that if you say one human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. No other scripture. Perfect. Now, can I ask you something? Yes, You've you are told most me this is wrong, yeah? 100% wrong. Fine, fine, fine. Now, why are you here? The way I look at it, all of these are innocent, loving people here. Why isn't this convention somewhere like Afghanistan and Pakistan trying to teach people that what they are doing is not Islam and is just some brainwashed chaos? And that they're going to go to hell and they're not going to go to heaven for killing innocent people, for the 911 attacks, for the London bombings. Innocent people died. If I don't like you and I kill you, it's more justified than if I don't like somebody, if I don't like Jews and I go and kill innocent Americans with families. Why don't you go and educate these people and have a better cause rather than converting four or five people here? Save thousands of lives. Brother has asked a very good question. He's telling me, why don't I go to Pakistan, to Afghanistan and spread this message and prevent this? Brother, I go every day, even now I'm going there. I'm on the satellite. We have Peace TV reaching 100 million people. This is how much? That's what I wanted to hear. This is 20, 30,000 people. The audience here will be 20, 30,000 people, not more than that. You see the recording. Why do we the recording? So that I can go to Pakistan, I can go to Afghanistan, I can go to even America and my lectures on jihad and terrorism, the maximum viewership, it has got more than 100 million people. And it is meant for the full world. I'm giving here, it is being recorded, being telecast. The thing is, I cannot force anyone at the point of the sort accept my message. Can I force you? Am I forcing you? Yeah. Am I forcing you to accept my message? No, 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 you're not forcing How can I force the people of Pakistan? How can I force the people of Afghanistan? At the same time, at the same time, at the same time, I also tell, the innocent people being killed, I agree with you. What's the numbers? You said, you know, four or five people converting here is better than telling that. My job is to deliver the message. Fazakrin naman tamazakir. Mentioned in the Quran, Surah Ghasha, chapter 88, verse number 21, 22. Our job is to deliver the message. We can't convert hearts. Allah told the Prophet, you are not the manager of affairs. It is Allah who gives the hidayah. I can talk. I cannot convert. It is Almighty God who converts. I can talk whether they understand or not in Pakistan. It is Almighty God. Coming to your basic question. According to me, you should see my cassette. Is terrorism Muslim monopoly? Is terrorism Muslim monopoly? If you see that cassette, your mind, your vision of terrorism will improve. Time does not permit me to give a talk here again. But I'll tell you for sure. According to me, the terrorists are mainly the politicians. It is they who create this. You go anywhere, you know in India, all the riots that took place, indirectly or directly, it's the politician. Babri Masjid, why did Babri Masjid riot take place? Why? Because the politicians. Gujarat riot, politicians. What we realize, we are speaking the truth. So many people say, when I gave a talk in London on terrorism, very good talk, people enjoyed. A youngster comes and says, death to George Bush, death to George Bush. Full talk of mine gone. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were two staunchest enemies of Islam. Both were called Umar, Umarain. The Prophet prayed to Allah that give Hidayah to one of these two Umar. And Umar bin Khattab, who was the second guy of Islam, Allah gave Hidayah, who was the staunchest enemy of Islam, became the staunchest supporter. Therefore I said, may Allah give Hidayah to George Bush. I cannot. I can speak. I cannot give Hidayah. I can tell him what he's doing is wrong. I don't want to kill him. I want him to accept Islam. Killing is useless. What's the use of killing? Accepting is better. So that's the reason we are giving the message. Those whose hearts are opening, they're accepting. Inshallah, God will open your heart also one day. When God opens your heart one day, I cannot do it. I can give the message. I can't force you. Unless God gives you, unless you strive. If you strive, God will help you. If you don't strive, your heart will not be opened. Some people ask question only for questioning. I a question Bushne ka. But the true gentleman, Marat ka bacha, wo hai. When he gets the answer, he accepts it. You know, people just ask for questioning. 
मैं क्वेश्चन पूछने के लिए यू स्पोक वेरी लाउडली आई एम आस्किंग आई गिव अ स्पीच आई सेट सो मेनी थिंग्स डू यू अग्री विद नॉट यस आई अग्री विद इट आर यू हिंदू आई एम एक्चुअली योर फेवरेट आई एम एन एथियस्ट एथियस माशाल्लाह आई हर्ड यू एंजॉय यू आर एथियस यू आर माय फेवरेट नो आई एम नॉट योर फ्रेंड बट आई वाज टोल्ड दैट यू लाइक हैविंग डिबेट्स विद सच यस यस फेव एथियस ओके ब्रदर यू आर एन एथियस्ट फाइन आई वुड लाइक टू कांग्रेचुलेट यू You'd like to what? I'd like to congratulate you. You know why? Why? The reason I congratulate you because all the others, all the human beings, they're blindly following. Father is a Christian, so son is a Christian. His parents are Hindu, he's a Hindu. Many of the Muslim parents are Muslims. You are thinking. I don't know their father was atheist. No, father was atheist. No. Mm. Ah, good. So you are thinking. These are the people they worship. This Almighty God who falls down and breaks. So you are thinking, and the reason I congratulate you is because you have said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La Ilaha, there is no God. You have already said half the kalma, but not the second part. They have said the full kalma. You are half Muslim now. Atheist means half kalma. You know, La Ilaha. Only thing I have to do is Inna Allah, but Allah which I shall do, Insha Allah. I'm congratulating you because you have agreed to the other people who believe in wrong God. First, I have to spend half my time in trying to convince them the God you are worshiping is wrong. You have already agreed there is no God. Only thing I have to do is prove to you about Allah, which I shall do, Insha Allah. Brother, suppose there is equipment which is bought. Equipment is bought in front of you. No one in the world has ever seen. No human being has seen is bought in front of you. And if I ask you the question, who is the first person? Who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that equipment? I heard this speech, and it's the creator. It's the creator. So the creator of that equipment will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that object. You may say creator, you may say manufacturer, you may say inventor, you may say maker, whatever it is, somewhat similar. Now I am asking you a question: How did this universe come into existence? How did this universe come into existence? You are going to now mention the Big Bang and all. No, I'm that. asking you. Yeah. Don't tell me what I'm going to mention. Well, I want to know what. If, what is the? If you. No, you are. I'm asking you according to your knowledge. No, the thing is, I've actually heard this speech before. I'm Fine. actually a good fan of yours. You know that. Mashallah, you're a good fan. Good fan, theoretical or practical? If you're a practical fan, practical. you will follow. If I'm wrong, you correct me. If I'm right, you join me. No, I only learnt about you about two weeks back, actually. Fine. So in two weeks, you became a great fan. Mashallah, I'm very happy about it. in two ways you learn about me that means you know you know about the creation the big bang yes, which yes, we yes, came yes, to know yes, recently that, quran yes. mentioned 14 years ago in surah ambiya chapter 21 verse number 30 awalam yar ladina kafaru and well, the verse is but fine but you know that <laughs> yeah similarly we did not know that the earth was spherical we came to know recently quran mentioned 14 years ago in surah nazia chapter 7 yes, and verse number 30 it is spherical we thought first the light of the moon is own light quran mentioned 14 years ago the light of the moon is not its own light reflected light which we came to know recently who could have mentioned this there is biology there is water cycle which you learned in school there is embryology there is genetics my question is Who could have mentioned all these things in the Quran? So, if you have heard this, you also know the answer. Who could have mentioned in the Quran? Same answer. The Creator. The Creator. This Creator, who has mentioned in the Quran, we call as Allah. So that means you believe in the Creator. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The Creator. The Creator who created the human beings, the person who created all this universe. It can't be a human being who writes all this. So now, do you believe in a creator? Well, there are different perspectives. You see, a person a has. You can we'll think about on. science, or you can think about God. Now, the debate is which to follow. No, we can follow both. I believe But in as both. I, as I I'm said, a, I'm a student of science also. Also, I am a believer in God. Both. As as my opening question stated, what I asked about terrorism, I believe you also know those are certain facts that. Brother, we'll come to terrorism later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, brother. We are talking brother, about brother, that. Brother, Why brother, I don't brother, believe. Brother, brother, wait, brother, wait. You asked me direct question: suicide bombing, killing innocent, wrong. I gave direct answer. Now I am asking you direct question. You give me direct answer. You ask me. You are happy with my answer. No beating around the bush. I am asking you directly. When you believe in the Creator, why don't you accept the Creator? I am asking you directly. So you ask me direct question in front of thirty thousand people. I give a direct answer. I am asking you direct question. 
You didn't believe in God, I congratulate you. Now I prove to you that the Creator wrote the Quran. Now I'm asking the question, why don't you believe in the Creator? I didn't say that I believe in the Creator. No, I you was said just the Creator. mimicking your speech, oh, I didn't I watched. Brother, I didn't ask you to come here to mimic me, please. Did I ask you to come and mimic me? I asked you, who wrote? You said Creator. I didn't say, did I say that? No, but that's Even in my you, speech, I don't what, say. That's what you said. Even I didn't say, speech. the questioner said. That means you haven't seen my speech correctly. Like how you are telling, when I ask an yes, yes, he gives the reply, Creator, not I. Not I. That means I haven't seen my speech correctly. It is a person like you, who I might have asked the question to, he gave the reply. Like how you gave the reply now. Did I ask you to mimic or did I ask you to give answer from your heart? So that means you are not a very truthful person, no? You asked me a question, brother. I gave answer directly from my heart, correct? Yes. I'm asking a question, you gave the answer, now you're saying that I'm mimicking. Okay, if I say the creator is what you want to hear, now... Not what if, I want to no, hear. No, 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 listen, hypothetically here. Not hypothetically. If, if we say that I agree to the creator, now what if I say that I agree to the creator of what was written, but I don't believe what was written justifies everything. You're giving me six facts. Correct, you're correct, correct. Me, very good, very good. You're wait, 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 wait. Six things, but there's a lot in life that's not written there. Fine, fine. There's Come, nothing wait, about wait, 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 wait. gravity or you're just telling me about light on the correct. moon. Correct. Very the good, very good, very good. The brother says he believes in the creator, but everything is not there. Brother, this book, the Quran, is not a book of science. S C I E N C E. It's a book of signs. S I G N S. It's a book of ayats. There are more than 6,000 signs, 6,000 ayats in the Quran, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. It's not a book of science. Two plus two is equal to four, that's not written there. But the beauty of it is what is written, we did not know. You mean me did not me the creator wrote. If it had everything of science, it would be a voluminous book as big as the World Trade Center. Or maybe it's Buruj Dubai tallest yeah. building now. It is not a book of science, brother. Please don't misunderstand. It is to prove to the scientist that this is the word of God. This is the word of creator. What do you have to tell me to disprove it? You have to take out a mistake in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 82. Do they not consider the Quran with K? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradictions in it. There would have been mistakes in it. So for you to disprove the Quran to be the word of Allah, you have to take out mistakes. That's the reason I said, please come up and take out mistakes in the Quran. Why? If it's wrong, I will leave it. If it's right, you join me. It's a two-way, not one way. But uh, how old is the Quran? I don't exactly know. How the old Quran is, the Quran? is approximately 1400 years old. Okay, and how long have human beings existed in this planet? Human beings in millions of years. Millions of years. Uh, I'm not challenging you. Don't, don't get this wrong. I've just, no, I'm, I like I people challenging you, me. What is I the like reason? people challenging yeah. me. Okay, if you want to challenge, then I'll, I'll take that step then. Okay, what is the reason that, uh, first of all, is I believe Christianity is older than... Uh, Islam. It's, no, no, you're uh, wrong. Years, uh, you're wrong. Is Christianity is not older than how, Islam. How, what's the difference? Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. Okay. From the first human being, it's already there. Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. He came 1400 years ago. He was the last messenger. Quran is the last revelation, not the first revelation. This is the last testament. Hmm. Otherwise, Islam is there since time immemorial. Isa right. salam, Jesus Christ was a Muslim according to the Quran. Abraham was a Muslim according to the Quran. Peace be upon them all. So Islam means peace acquired by submitting our will to Almighty God. It is there since time immemorial. Okay, so getting to the point, I asked you the time scale that the Quran has existed and the time scale of human beings. After you Not time scale of Quran. Islam is there since time immemorial. Yeah, no, no, of the Quran, the book, Quran. No, uh, the holy book. Uh, not, not Islam, we can say Islam existed for forever, but why was the Quran invent, uh, placed on earth afterwards? Very and, good. And, and, very good, very good and, question. And uh, I also wanted to ask you something I always wanted to know about, that is the uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy on that, but why do you, do you believe in evolution or you believe man was placed directly? And the whole thing of apes, the science that has proved that human beings emanated from apes. 
Do you agree with Brother that? Brother asked two questions that science… Two questions, sorry about that. No problem. Two questions, do you believe in Darwin's theory? Science has proved that human beings have been evaluated from ape. Do you believe in? Do you believe that human beings are placed? And second question, why was Quran revealed 14 years back? Why not before? Two questions. Regarding a correction in your question. Science hasn't proved that human beings have been evolved from ape. It is Darwin's theory, not Darwin's fact. It's a theory. There is no book today. There is no book today on the face of the earth which says the fact of evolution. It's theory. The fact of the origin of human beings. No, it's theory. And for your information, Darwin himself said that there were missing links in his theory. If you read his book on the origin of species, he writes in this on a ship by the name of HMS Beagle. He goes to an island by the name of Calatropis. And there he sees birds were pecking in niches, in holes. Based on the holes they pecked, the beak of the birds became short and long. Based on that observation, he propounded the theory of natural selection. He wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1861 that I have no proof for my theory of evolution, but because it helps me in giving replies to embryology, to genetics, that's the reason I'm propounding. He had no proof on it. That's the reason in our school, you know, to joke around, we used to say, if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate, I'm telling my colleague, he's a ape, he's a monkey. There were missing links. Furthermore, all the three stages today, science and advance, we have come to know that the first stage, the Australopithecus, and the Ice Man. The next stage that we have, Neanderthal Man, Cro-Magnon. All these stages that we have today of the human being that we found, there's no link between them. Certain things what Darwin said, that life is evolved from water, I agree with it. Quran says that, Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, wa ja'alna min al kullah shayin hai. We have created every living thing from water, I believe in that. But saying that we have evolved from one species to the other is a hypothesis. According to molecular biologist, Francis Craig, he said, it is letting your imagination run too wild to say that we have been evolved from apes. If that was true, today we'll find someone in between man and human being. You only find in Hindu scriptures. You don't find anywhere in the world a monkey man. Do you find? So what? Do you think evolution has stopped now? It is a hypothesis. And most of the scientists today disagree with it. There is only a small negligible percentage which yet believe in Darwin's theory. Majority of the scientists have already disproved Darwin's theory. I feel your knowledge of science is not up to date, brother. But Dr. Naik. Not but, wait. All right. You are asking me a question, I am replying. Then we have to give chance to others. You have already asked five, six questions. No, Let's I do justice. Just having fun, that's all. Sorry? I thought you were being entertained with Having fun? Oh, I'm, besides entertaining you, I want to entertain the other non-Muslim brothers. If all non-Muslim girls will come back to you. All so right. what we realize, Darwin's theory, brother, your knowledge on science is weak. We say Adam and Eve were the first human beings. That's what the Quran says. Furthermore, regarding your second question. Okay. I have to answer your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not answered second question, you want to put the third question. That means you aren't listening to me. Or you have forgotten you have asked two questions. No, no, I've asked you the first one. That means you're a good questioner, huh? Now you ask me the question, why was Quran revealed 1400 years back? Why not earlier? You know my son, he wants to become a doctor. He's telling me, Father, Abba, why do you want me to put in school and college? Why don't you put me in medical college directly? I said, son, first go to nursery, then go to primary, then go to secondary school, then go to college, then go to medical college. I can't put him in medical college directly. Why? He should know the basics. Similarly, Almighty God is our creator. He kept on sending other revelations. Almighty God, our creator, thought 1400 years back was the right time that human beings could absorb this message. He revealed it. He is our creator. He knows better than you and me. 1400 years back, he revealed his last message. The Quran to the last and final messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5 verse number 3 On this day have I perfected my religion for you, the perfect form and have completed my favor on you, you talk about the human beings and has chosen for you Islam After this, nothing new can be added into the basics of Islam nothing can be subtracted, that's it So Almighty God knows when we can imbibe the message of the Quran and this is the last testament Last messenger, Prophet Muhammad, no other messenger come after this. Hope this answers your question. That and I hope that you even accept, besides being my fan, you also accept my teachings, inshallah. Maybe next time when you come here. Maybe next time. Maybe.
You tell me I'll come again tomorrow. I'm flying tomorrow. I'll come back fast for you alone. Shall we have the next question from the sister side? Finally, um, my name's Tanya. I work for Cisco. Uh, I'm not here to disagree with anything, but I've always had a lot of people, especially Muslims, well, not a lot of people, just Muslims, always telling me, because you're a Catholic, you're going to go to Jahannam, but we're Muslims, you need to convert and you will go to heaven. According to me, I'm a good Catholic. I try to be a good Catholic. I don't intentionally commit sin. But does that mean because I'm a Catholic, I'm going to go to hell? And if I'm a Muslim, I'm going to go to heaven? Sister asked a question that many of her Muslim friends say, because she's a Catholic, because she's a Christian, she will go to hell. That is it true that because she's a Christian, you'll go to hell? Sister, according to me, if you're a true Christian, if you truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, inshallah, you shall go to Jannah. But, but if you truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Seek ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. Correct? Now, what you are following, I don't know. Are you following your church, or are you following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? If you are following your church, the chances of going to Jannah is very high. If you are following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Inshallah, Inshallah, you shall go to Jannah. Now, if you read the Bible, there are sayings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. I don't know how much you are well versed with the Bible. Now, all the sayings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, are in red letter. Are in? Red, red letter. Yeah. Sister, do you believe Jesus to be God? Well, I'm a bit confused about that, so I'm not going to get into that. No, I'm I asking just... yes or no. Well... Confused God. No, it's, it's not confusion, but I don't want to answer something I don't know. And it's not funny. I'm not saying it's you know or not. Sister, I'm not saying you know or not. What do you believe I'm asking? No, I do believe he's God. Yes, yes that's it. I'm not saying yes. what you know. You may not I be do. able to prove it. Yeah, Fine. I do. Sister, I'll tell you one thing. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any main intervention. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. Yes. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, they are going together. But one may ask, where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is, sister, that most of the Christians, almost all, they believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is Almighty God. They believe he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. There is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. Sister, if you can point out a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement anywhere from the Bible in which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or which is worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. In fact, if you read the Bible, I'm not talking about you accepting I'll come to me it. or not. I'm I, not. I got my answer. I'm giving you, yes. I'm, I got my answer. You got half the answer. I'm giving the complete answer, okay. Insha. You can go ahead. You got half the answer. Okay. I told you that if you're a true Christian, you shall go to Jannah. Yes. You don't know what a true Christian is. I am giving you information about true Christian is. Okay. If you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, submitted his will to God. He was a Muslim. He never said he was God. It's clearly mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 24. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that the words that you hear are not mine, but Father, whom thou hast sent. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. So Jesus Christ is a man approved of God amongst you 
by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you have witnessed it. So from the Bible we come to know that Jesus Christ was one of the most beloved messengers of Almighty God. We love him, we respect him. Do we follow his teachings? If you compare what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Bible, I told that yesterday that we Muslims, we follow more of the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel of Luke, he was circumcised on the eighth day. We Muslims are circumcised, most of the Christians are. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, you have to follow each and every law. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse number 17. Everything of the Old Testament, you can't break one law or dot or a tittle. As I mentioned in my speech, it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verse number 8, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 2 to 5, and the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 to 8, that you should not have pork. We Muslims don't have pork, but most of the Christians have pork. It's mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse number 18. Book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse number 1, you should not have alcohol. Muslims don't have alcohol, but Christians have alcohol. So if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. So if you become a true Christian and truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I go, shall I send him? It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the Spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that here shall he speak. He shall glorify me. Verbatim quotation from the Bible, King James Version. So Jesus Christ is prophesying about the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you're a true Christian, if you truly believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, you have to believe in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So if you're a true Christian, you'll believe in Prophet Muhammad and inshallah you shall go to Jannah. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. So sister, are you a true Christian or not? We would like all the questioners to keep their questions short and to the point so that we can entertain in the limited time as many questioners as we possibly can. Let us ask the next question from the brother's side. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aditya Mashel Kar and I work for Dubai First. Uh, we are a finance company. Uh, I have a very simple one line question. Uh, what and why is the difference between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims? Wa alaikum as salam, brother Aditya. May peace be on you too. MashaAllah, speaking Arabic, salam means may peace be on you. Islam is a religion of peace. He has the question, basic question, what is the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslim? Correct? Yes. Brother, there is no Sunni and Shia in the Quran. Read the Quran, there is no Sunni Shia in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamiya wa la tafarraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. You have to follow Allah and His Rasul. Follow the Quran and the authentic Hadith. Shiaism came later on because of political differences. It has nothing to do with Islam. In Islam, there's no sect. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 159, If anyone makes sects in the region of Islam, O Prophet, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will look after the affairs. There are many verses in the Quran which say, making sect in the religion of Islam is prohibited. There is no sect. All these are because of political differences that came. But in Islam, there's nothing like Shia Sunni. There's only Muslim. Muslim is a person who submits his will to God. So in that case, uh, which belief is more correct, Shia or Sunni? The belief which believes in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith is correct. The belief. The person who believes in the teachings of Quran and the Sahih Hadith is correct. The moment you ask questions, if he gives reference from the Quran, he's correct. If he says, my Sheikh says this, my Sheikh said that, my Imam said this. If the saying of the Imam matches with the Quran, we match with it. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, Allah, obey Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messengers. And those who have been given the power of Amr, of commandment. But the verse does not stop that, continues. But if the people of knowledge differ, go back to Allah and his Rasul. If two scholars say two different things, check up which scholar matches with Quran and Sahih Hadith. The one who follows this Quran and Sahih Hadith is on the straight path, is a true Muslim, the other is not. So brother, which one would you like to choose? Shia or Sunni? 
<laughs> well, so I'm, I'm a Hindu, so Sorry? I, I I'm a Hindu. I, I really don't know much, but it was just that I was curious to know uh, about, you know, no, uh, where did I this thought, come from? I thought now you have to decide. Should I become a Shia or a Sunni? <laughs> no, not really, sir. So I'm I thought a born a Hindu and I die a Hindu. <laughs> born a Hindu, brother, even I was born a Hindu. I don't know that I die as Hindu. You know what the definition of the word Hindu? Hindu by definition means a person who lives in the land of Indus Valley. The people who live in India are called as Hindu. Correct. This word Hindu is not in any of the religious scriptures. It was first used by the Arabs. When the Arabs came to India, they gave the word Hindi. Hindi hai. You know, when I go to Saudi and here, they call me Hindi. Hindi means a person India. coming from India. India. It is not a religion. So you are a Hindu, I am a Hindu geographically. Hindu is not a religious definition at all. According to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, if you read his book, Discover of India, he writes, the word Hindu doesn't exist in any of the Hindu scriptures before the advent of the Arabs to India. So Hindu is a geographical definition, brother. Even I'm a Hindu. I come from India. And the Arabs call me Hindi, Hindi. Hindi doesn't mean idol worshipper. Hindi means coming from India. So I know you're a Hindu. I'm talking about a religious belief. If you're religious belief, do you believe in one God? Well, sir, I know where we're going, but uh, I'm a very strong believer of the fact. No, I that, don't. Uh, I'm saying a statement would no, not change. No, I'm not my telling you, brother. Beliefs. I'm not you telling you to change your religion. Put me in a mosque. I'm that, not that's... telling. I'm not telling you to change your religion. If I ask you, do you believe in God? You said yes. If I say, do you believe in idols? You may say no. Then I correct you. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so your question is, do you believe in? Do one you God? believe in one God? No. I oh. believe in a lot of gods. Okay, we have fine. 33 crore gods. Very good, God. very good. Now I want to help you. Don't become a Muslim. But I want to help you. Because you are not a Muslim, I want to help you more. Now you said you believe in 33 crore gods. Where you got this from? The Hindu scriptures, correct? Now if you read Chandogya... I just heard about it, sir. From to be where? Very honest, oh, so you believe... Cited. Oh, mashallah. So you believe in anything? What do you hear? Why don't you believe in what you hear from me? Well, I, sir, am I your enemy, brother? I love you, brother. Well, sir, I love where, you. Where, where I come from, uh, it's it's not that uh, I've just heard it from one person the way you said it, uh, but yeah, I've heard it from my parents, my uncles, and probably 1.2 billion people in India believe Fine. exactly the way I believe. Fine. So so I, so it's not I that all of, all of us are all of us are doing something wrong. I'll correct you. There's something which you. we are doing right, which is common between I disagree. Us, which I believe is Hinduism. I disagree that 1.2 billion believe. I do agree majority of the Hindus believe, not all. I know many Hindus who disagree with what you have said. Because those who have read the Hindu scriptures, where you get this from? From the scriptures. Correct. Anyone says from the mind, if your father tomorrow says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you believe? If, oh, your, sir, father sir, I, I didn't if you. your father says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you believe? Uh, well, not unless somebody corrects me. No, if your father tells you today, 2 okay. plus 2 is equal to 5, no, will you believe? I will not believe. MashaAllah, you're an educated man, therefore you won't believe, correct? correct? Now, I'm giving you reference from your scriptures. Okay. Right? You have to ask your father, in Hindu scriptures, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of scriptures. One is Shruti, one is Smriti. Shruti means the word of God. Vedas, uh, Upanishads. Next comes Smriti. The Puranas, the Itihas, Ramayan, Mahabharat. If you read Upanishad, the most superior, it's mentioned in Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's a Sanskrit quotation, brother. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Nakasya kasij janitana chadipa. Of that God, there is no superior. There are no parents. It's mentioned in Sveta Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na Patima Asti. Of that God, there is no image. Pratima in Sanskrit means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a sculpture, a statue. Sveta Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19 says, Na Tasya Patima Asti. Of that God, there are no images, no photographs, no paintings, no pictures, no statues, no idols. If you read the Vedas, I'm talking about the highest scriptures, I'm not talking about lower scriptures. I'm talking about Shrutis. Shrutis consists of Upanishads and Vedas. It's mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na Tasya Pratima Asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. 
of that God, there are no images, there are no photographs, there are no paintings, there are no pictures, there are no idols, there are no statues. You will tell me, I know where you're taking me. I'm not taking you anywhere. I'm taking you to your scriptures. I'm taking you to your scriptures. Fine. That's the different thing. Your scriptures match with the Quran. What can I do? Furthermore, brother, if you read Yajurvay chapter number 40, verse number 9, it says, Andhat Prabhavishanti ya Asambuti Mupaste. They are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambuti. Asambuti are natural things like fire, water, air, etc. Who says that? Yajurvay. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Sambuti. Sambuti are the created things like table, chair, car, idol, etc. Who says that? Yajurvay chapter number 40, verse number 9. Now, when your father told you about Thai three gods, I don't know whether he gave you references or not. I'm giving you references. You can take my references, note it down, take the video cassette, go and ask your father. Go and ask your pandit. I'm not telling you to believe me blindly, brother. You believed your father blindly, you did a mistake once. Don't do the mistake the second time. If you know where I'm taking you, I'm not in a hurry. I want you to be a firm believer, not just because my father said. So tomorrow you can quote the scriptures. Fine. Now, if you are a Hindu, true Hindu, you should follow the scriptures. Like the sister that came earlier, she asked me a question once, she asked me twice, she asked me third time, she got convinced. You don't get convinced, no problem. You take time. She got convinced with three questions. I'm not forcing you. It's not allowed in Islam. I'm only giving you guidance. I Thank cannot, you for that, sir. I cannot, Thank you. I cannot give it unless Almighty God puts it in your heart. So if you want to search the truthfulness in Almighty God, all these references you can go and check up. Go and ask your father, go and ask your pandit. I want not you, I want your father to come along with you, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much for all the information, sir. May God bless you. Inshallah. Shall we have the next question from the brother? Greetings to you in the mighty and matchless name of God. My name is Paul and I'm a student. I have a doubt. I mean, uh, most people would also have, I mean, you've already spoken about free will and uh, things like that. I have doubts about free will as to what free will is and uh, do we have free will to do what we want to do. And uh, as you quoted uh, uh, chapter 2 verse 256 from Quran, there is no compulsion in religion and the truth will stand out from falsehood, right? So, I am looking for truth and the truth will set me free, yeah? That is John chapter 8, verse 32. Correct, you're right. I mean, I'm not as great as you in uh, quoting things from uh, no, great. Bible and Quran, whatever, but I just want to know as to whether we have free will and what free will is and uh, when they say, and the quotation that I said, that there is no compulsion in religion, what is compulsion here? I mean, I don't know sure whether it is, I've taken it out of context and quoted it, what is before it and what is after it because my friends couldn't explain to me what was there before it and after it. Do Probably I'll have to, to read it and when you say there is no compulsion, uh, made to do like say, suppose you have to say prayers five times a day, right? Do we, is it compulsory? The brother asked two questions. The first question, what is a free will? And as Gospel of John chapter 8 verse 32 says that seek the truth and truth shall free you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon said that. And he quote from the Quran, like Rafid Deen, chapter 2, Surah Baqarah, verse number 256. MashaAllah is comparing, you know, great. He says he seeks the truth and I pray to God that may that truth set you free. Correct. As far as free will is concerned, free will means what you want you can do. For example, today I want to destroy the full world. Can I do it? I can try, but I will not succeed. You understand? Free will means what is in your capacity. Whatever is in your capacity you can do. Whether you are able to do or not, that is secondary. For example, in my capacity to give a lecture. You can try, like how you tried and you gave a quotation. Whether you can give the full lecture, I don't know. But you have the free will to try. So similarly, you have the free will to rob. You have the free will to become honest. You have the free will to kill. You have the free will to save a human life. It's your free will. So free will means you can do what you want. No one can force you. Fine? No one can force you. Now, coming to the question of La Ikhra Fiddin, chapter 2, verse 256. There is no compulsion in religion, but truth stands out clear from error. Here means you cannot force anyone to accept Islam at the point of the sword. I cannot take a gun and put it on his forehead and say, accept Islam. It's not allowed. 
I cannot force anyone. But when I give the logical reasons, for example, doctor says, you have diabetes. Don't have sugar. Oh, doctor is forcing me not to have sugar. Yes. He's compelling me. If I don't want to listen to doctor, I can go and yet have chocolate. Fine. So the doctor is advising you. But an intelligent man will not have sugar. Will have less sugar. But the doctor cannot force him. Brother. No, I think you're looking down. I'm wondering. No, I'm, I'm trying to concentrate Constant. more on you rather than anything else. Fine. So the thing is that, that if the doctor tells you something, you can use the word, the doctor compelled me not to have sugar. But the right word is the doctor advised me and I'm following. Similarly, like, is it compulsory to pray five times? For a Muslim, yes. It's compulsory. Is it a compulsion? It's not a compulsion with force. If he doesn't want, he doesn't pray. He can say, I don't believe in Allah. No one can force him. Because he agrees with the system. Ah, if I pray five times, I am getting guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am on the straight path, therefore I am praying five times. Like how a doctor advises you, don't have sugar. He wants to follow, he follows. You have to fast. It's advised by Almighty God. Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse 183. Fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. Your taqwa will increase. So I'm fasting. No one can force me with a gun to fast. Is it compulsory to fast? Yes, for a Muslim. Is there compulsion in religion? No one can force me. I should fast with physical force. So that's talking about physical force. No one can physically force anyone to do anything. It's your free will. No, but then uh, why is it called, why is it that we, it is compulsory to fast, compulsory to... There are two types of compulsory. One compulsory is with reason and logic. The other compulsory is with force. What Quran is talking about, compulsion is force. Like when doctor says, don't have sugar. Is it compulsory? Yes. Doctor will say, compulsory, don't have sugar. Is the doctor forcing you? Literally, yes. With logic, not with a gun. Right or wrong? So the doctor is saying, compulsory, no sugar for you. If you have faith in doctor, you follow. If you don't have faith, you don't follow. So same way, this is advice given by Almighty God in the Quran. If you believe Almighty God is the creator, you follow. If you don't believe, you don't follow. So anyone who is a Muslim is a person who submits his will to Almighty God. The free will God has given, I can either go against the commandment of God or I can follow his commandment. After God has given me free will, if I follow his commandment, I am called as a Muslim. A Muslim is a person who submits his will to Almighty God. There is no physical force on me. The compulsion that's spoken in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 256 is the physical compulsion. It is not the logical compulsion. Two plus two is how much? Four, I said it. Is it compulsory four? I mean, that's, that, that is free will, yeah? It is your choice Correct. to choose Correct. You can say three will. also. Correct. You can say five also. If I can say it is three, then I, can, I have to prove it, right? No, no, even don't prove you can say three. Anyone can do anything to you. I didn't get it, sir. You can say three also without proving. Can anyone do anything to you? If you say 2 plus 2 equal to 3, illogically, what can you do? But then they'll say he doesn't know maths. So what's there? But you can say or not? Can you yeah, say or not? Yes. yes. That is a free but will. But people no? will call you. Ah, that is a free will. Correct. That's what I want. But if you say 2 plus 2 equal to 3, people will say you don't know maths. So if you say 2 plus 2 is 4, it's not compulsory. Same way. If you pray 5 times, you are a Muslim. If you say don't pray 5 times, you're not a Muslim. Simple. So it is a compulsion with reason and logic. So as you told, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is compulsory. Why? For a person who knows maths. For a person who doesn't know maths, he may not say 2 plus 2 is 4. He may say 2 plus 2 is 5. 2 plus 2 is 6. So this is compulsion of reason, logic, and iman, and belief. So, hope that answers the question. No, as in, why are you, why? Do you have a new question? No, it's not a new question. It's like, uh, since No, did I answer your question or not? Yes, sir. Okay. You answer the question. Yeah, okay. Do you have a new question? No yeah, problem, you can ask. Okay, what I'm saying is, it says, I mean, now you're saying it has, we have to do it five times. Now, if I say I do it ten times, hmm. but I'm not doing it at uh, the prayer time, say Asr, I'm not doing it at Maghrib, I'm not doing it at these certain times, hmm. but I do it. Hmm. And uh, I do it when I'm, when I'm going to eat my food before the meal, I, I'll, I'll say my prayer. When I'm sitting, when I'm standing, when I'm walking, when I'm running, 
Fine. Correct. So, Do but now why, why, why the word compulsory five times? Fine. That I'm not. Now, for doctor say don't have sugar. Okay, doctor, I won't have sugar. I won't have salt. I won't have rice. I will die. Don't have sugar. Okay, I won't have sugar. I won't have rice. I won't have bread. I won't have food. I won't have non-veg. I won't have veg. Person will die. So you can't go overboard. Doctor says don't have sugar. Okay, at this time have medicine. You can have sugar at so and so time. Have limited. So this is because doctor knows. Now you try and become more intelligent than the Creator, than Almighty God. He knows better than you and me. Fine. If you say no, no, I'll do like that. Then you will suffer. So doctor knows the human body. Almighty Creator knows us better. So He's our Creator. He has given the advice. If you follow, you will be called as a Muslim submitting will to God. If you don't follow, there's no compulsion of force. I cannot force you to accept Islam. Can I force you? No. No, you cannot because I have the free will. Correct. With your free will, some people like my answer, they accept it. It's not necessary you also have to accept. Tomorrow if you agree, you're a seeker of truth. Correct? You're a seeker of truth, shall free you. Because I'll ask, I'll seek and then I'll know. Sure. Once you're convinced, you're most welcome. So I'm waiting for the day that you're convinced. Hopefully, inshallah. The next question from the brother. Yes, my dear brother, Dr. Zahagi. How are you? I'm sure you are tired and... Uh, I have a very simple question. You know Sikhism, the foundation stone or Amritsar Guru Mandar was given a chance to a Muslim by the name Mia Mir. Why, on the contrary, you say a non-Muslim cannot go to the house of God? What's your comments about it? Brother said, how am I? I said, Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Am I tired? I never get tired of answering questions to non-Muslims. I never get tired. You're have, very kind. I have my flight tomorrow, 11 o'clock morning. You're fine. very kind. So for me, no problem. I love it. The more you ask questions, the more energy I get. You ask the question that a Muslim laid the foundation of Amritsar. Then golden why? Temple, yeah. Sorry? The golden temple. Golden the temple. Holy the holy temple. Place. Laid the foundation. So why can't non-Muslims go to Makkah. But I gave the answer in my talk. If, if someone has permitted, maybe Amritsar is not a place of sanctuary. It's not a cantonment area. Makkah and Madina is a cantonment area. You can go to any other mosque. If you want to go to the mosque of Dubai, I will take you. Brother, it's the most you want to come to the Sikh religion, Amritsar, Golden Temple. I know that. I know that very well, brother. But it may not be as sacred as our Makkah and Medina. If you want to go to any other mosque, you're most welcome, I will take you. But these two mosques, as I mentioned in my answer, they are the cantonment area and you require a visa. The visa to go to Makkah and Medina, these two mosques, is to say with your tongue, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If you don't get visa, you cannot go there. If I recite those verses, can I go there? Yes, if you recite and you believe, you can, no one can stop you. That's no problem. So you want to recite those verses? To go there or because you believe in it? I did hear. You re repeated these verses with the other people. I huh? did hear. And so I, do you believe in it? Oh, it's easy to repeat. No, no. Do you repeat? Do it's you a, believe in it? It's, it's a fact. It's there. It's a fact and the fact should be believed. So do you believe that there's one God? There is. Do I you believe in it. And do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? By without any doubts, yes. So he person is the who last prophet, yes. So person who believes there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger is a Muslim. So if you say That's this and right. you believe that no one can stop you to go to Makkah and Medina. I am principally I am a true Muslim because I have surrendered to the Mashallah, of the God. Mashallah. So would you like to say it in Arabic? Congratulations, brother. Would you like to repeat it in Arabic, brother? Would you like to repeat it in Arabic? I don't mind. Okay. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Anna. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abdu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I'm saying in English the translation. I bear witness. I bear witness. Bear witness. That there is no God. 
that there is no god but allah but allah and prophet muhammad and prophet muhammad is is the messenger is the messenger and servant of allah and the servant of allah servant of allah mashallah mashallah <laughs> brother may allah reward you we welcome you to the fold of the religion of peace and inshallah when you want to go to makkah and madina please let me know i will sponsor your trip thank you inshallah. very much thank you very much god bless you inshallah <laughs> i like your spirit i like yourself god bless you keep spreading this message people need it world need it world needs a peace world needs the peace leaders like you my blessings with you my good wishes with you the next question from the brother here good evening my name is rahul i work in an ad agency in media city i have to say aap confrontation handle karne mein kafi seasoned ho gaye and uh, i would like to ask you questions on two topics with respect uh, the first is uh, i do agree with you that uh, when you marry your direct brother the likelihood of uh, handicapped children is very very high but uh, i also agree to the fact that God, man was created with one pair and then they propagated from there but when you put the two together it creates a little confusion because if you marry your sister which obviously the first few did we should all be some level of handicap you know mashallah brother asked a very good question he tried to link the question that was asked yesterday and the question asked today i wasn't there yesterday <laughs> uh anyway the question asked yesterday was that if all human kind has been created from one pair of male and female how did humanity come into existence so then i said there that the rule that time was today the rule is that marrying among close brothers and sisters it's incest but that time the rule was that you cannot marry brothers and sisters of the same delivery adam and eve is the first pair of human beings later on their children but marrying brothers and sisters of same delivery was prohibited but different delivery was permitted different i'm sorry different deliveries deliveries if brothers and sisters born in the same delivery they were not permitted to marry but different deliveries they were permitted and later on the rule came that marrying brother and sister were the same delivery or different delivery is prohibited the rules keep on changing but the final concept the basic is same now coming to your question that if humanity has evolved then adam and eve they would have been handicapped so that's from telling you it is not 100% that if a brother and sister marry they should be handicapped it's not at all 100% chances are more maybe 1% maybe 2% it's not 100% at all for example if you have extra marital sex not that you will get aids it's not a must you will get std chances are there whatever it's not a must for example if you jump from the first floor if you jump from first floor there chances you'll die chances yes what maybe 1% maybe 2% if you jump from 100 floor chances may be 99 correct i agree so just because if i tell you if you jump from first floor you may die that doesn't mean you have to die the chances may be half percent 0.1 percent first floor is not very high so similarly there are chances doesn't mean that the person will have genetic problems so this is what when you pose a question you should know the percentage the percentage is very small and furthermore that proves that previously it wasn't the case so what we realize that this is not a must it's not a must but previously in the olden days yes brothers and sisters also got married but that time nothing happened it's not a very high chances and doctors is it possible any doctor will say it's possible if brother sister got married and did not have genetic problem very much possible no one can debate chances are there but didn't happen so that's how humanity was evolved and the ruling about the consanguine marriage i already told you earlier sahi hai Do you have any other question? Yeah, another one actually. Sure, most welcome. Now, now this is with regards to the practice of sunnah. I am told that it is uh, actually emulating the practices done by Prophet Muhammad. And uh, if we're only supposed to bow down to the formless God, why do we follow practices which are done by a human incarnation? Particularly things like growing your hair. to a certain length which may not have a particular significance in terms of benefit or kissing the hazra aswad when someone also declined that you are just a stone after prophet muhammad didn't kiss you i wouldn't do this either brother asked a very good question he asked a very good question that when we agree prophet muhammad peace be upon him is not almighty god why do you have to emulate him 
Why do you have to copy him if he's the incarnation of he's not incarnation of God? So in your sentence, no, a human incarnation, a human form. He's a human being. He is the best human being, but he's not God. Why do we follow? Because Almighty God has said that. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, Atiullah, ob Atiur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. God has said, God said, follow the Prophet, we follow. For example, I'm the boss of a company. I tell, follow my general manager. Now, you will say, why follow general manager, boss? Boss is saying so. If boss says, you have to follow. Unless the general manager goes against me. And if the trusted general manager never goes against me. So similarly, the prophet will never go against the teachings of Almighty God. It is because he is the messenger who has got the message of God for us. So when you emulate him, it gives us more blessings. But we can't worship him. We love the prophet. We revere him. We love him. We obey him. But we don't worship him. So people who go to Darga, Khwaja Mahinuddin Chiste and all this, this is wrong? It's nowhere mentioned in the Quran to go to Darga. There's no hadith saying go to Darga. And the second part, the significance of Hazrat Aswad? Hazrat Aswad again, because the Prophet kissed it, I'm emulating. It doesn't become the fard. It's not compulsory, I have to do it. Sunnat means you will get blessing. But in Sunnat, if you don't do, there's no negative point. In fard, you have to do it. If you don't do it, negative points. Like praying five times, you have to do. Don't do negative points. Sunnat means if you do, plus points. If you don't do, no negative points. So these are additional bonus points. So if you want bonus, you can do it. Not compulsory. If you don't do also, no one can say that you're not a good Muslim. So when you do it, you get additional bonus point. And a good Muslim tries to get more bonus point. But no one can say it's a sin. Therefore, it becomes the sunnah. So Prophet kissed it, we are kissing it. Even if you don't kiss it, yet there's no problem. Hope that's the question. Sahih. Thanks very much. You're welcome. The next question from the brother side. Uh, hi, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Sinto John. I work for RAK Ceramics as a sales executive. I'm a Christian and a strong believer in Jesus Christ as my God. I am well aware that all Muslims do consider Jesus Christ to a high regard as a prophet. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, issue on prohibition of pork in Islam. My first question is, do you consider all the words of Jesus and the miracles performed by Jesus as mentioned in the Bible? And uh, if so, uh, let me explain to you one thing. The premise in which Christians believe that pork or no food is prohibited is uh, from the gospel when Jesus says that uh, whatever comes into you goes out of you, but what comes from your heart is what, is what makes a man pure or impure. So if you consider that, then why do you think, and if you consider Jesus as a prophet, then why do you say that uh, pork is prohibited in Islam? And if not, what do you think Jesus meant by what, when he said that? Before I answer a question, I'd like to welcome the chairman of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award, Mr. Ibrahim Bumala, and also the deputy chairman, Dr. Saeed, for giving us a wonderful opportunity and making us available this hall till so late also, mashallah. I'd like to thank him and I pray to Almighty God that he gives more opportunity for people of Dubai to hear such lectures and so that more and more people get hidayah and inshallah, inshallah, the thawab of the people accepting Islam will also go to the Dubai International Quran Award, inshallah, to Dr. Ibrahim Bumala and also to Sheikh Muhammad, inshallah. The brother asked the question that do I believe in the miracles of Jesus Christ mentioned in the Bible? Brother, I believe Whatever is mentioned in the Bible, if it matches with the Quran, I believe in it. If it goes against the Quran, I disbelieve in it. If it does not go against, does not match, it is ambiguous. Whatever is matching with the Quran, I believe in it. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, that you say regarding the prohibition of pork, it has been nullified because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, whatever comes in to you goes out and main thing is from your heart. How does this nullify? You fail to realize that means you are not reading the Bible. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, it says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Whosoever shall break one jot or tittle from the law, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That means you cannot break one jot or tittle from the law. 
that's what Jesus Christ peace be upon him says. Now you pick up another verse and says, what comes into you goes out, what is from your heart, you can have spoke. Where does it mean you can have spoke? You're contradicting your God, Jesus Christ peace be upon him. It says, think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Unless the heavens and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle can pass away from the law until they are fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one law or tittle, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall keep it and teach men the same, they shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you want to go to Jannah, you have to be better than the Jews. You have to follow each and every commandment of Moses, peace be upon him. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20. Okay, if that is so, then what do you think he meant when he said that whatever you eat comes in, I mean, whatever comes in out and goes out of you, what is from your heart is what decides what is pure or impure. It is simple. What comes in goes out. What is the problem in that? No, the whatever question, you eat goes out. Is there any problem in that? No, it was asked in relevance when Jesus' disciples were questioned by the Jews that why are they not following the traditional ceremony of washing their hands before eating food. That's when Jesus replied that don't you understand that what you eat doesn't matter if it is pure or impure. What, it, what you eat, it, come, it goes into you and comes he, out of he you. He didn't say it doesn't matter what you're eating is pure and impure. That's your thing. It's not mentioned in the Bible that way. No, it is mentioned in the Bible that what you does eat... Does it say that whether what you're eating is pure or impure doesn't matter? Does it say that? No, it doesn't say. I'm sorry. Ah, okay. So please, please don't put your words in the Bible, please. Fine, fine, fine. But what I'm quoting is verbatim. Fine. You can check up. I'm quoting from my memory. I don't have the Bible in front of me. But what you're saying, you're putting your words into the Bible. No, but he definitely said that what you eat comes out of you. Of course, what, what you eat has to come out. But what, what do we have to come out? We are human beings. He wouldn't, he wouldn't simply state that for, I don't know, for it no It is simple. Sake. What do you eat comes out simple. Your heart means it is from your heart. That means your heart should follow the commandment. No, because Jesus we, Christ, peace be upon him, said earlier, don't break one jot or tittle. So if your heart is in it, you will not break a single jot or tittle. Simple explanation. Fine, you don't have to be a doctor of divinity. He was trying to prove the Jews wrong by saying that it is not important. No, not at all. He wasn't trying to do that. That's what you think. That's what the church tells you. It's plain black and white. No, Jesus no. said you cannot break one jot or tittle from the law. I'm so where is he telling the Jews to break the law of Judaism? He's not telling that. He is not giving any indication for the Jews to break the laws of Judaism. He's telling them to obey. It is your understanding of the Bible. But Nowhere he, does the Bible say that. He did think that the Jews were not completely obeying the laws. They Correct. Had. I agree with you. They were not completely obeying because they did not believe in the fulfillment of the Messiah. Because the Jewish scripture says there is a Messiah to come. We Muslims, we believe in it. The Jews don't believe. So he was trying to explain to them, I am the Messiah. But that doesn't mean he was trying to break the laws of the Jews. He was trying to fulfill. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Simple. I am asking you, do you have pork, brother? I'm sorry? Do you have pork? Yeah, I, I mean, occasionally. That means you're not a good Christian. You're not a good Christian. Even occasionally you break one law or a tittle, you shall not go to Jannah. Not Quran says that, Bible says that. Even if you have pork and you break one law or a tittle, you shall not go to paradise. You shall not enter eternal life. And you said that you are a practicing Christian. You said you believe Jesus Christ is God. I don't believe Jesus is God, but I follow his teachings. I love him more than you. This is what Jesus said. It's from the heart. This is the explanation of your verse. It's from my heart. I love him. I love Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him. Do you? I don't think so. It is I theoretical. Do. Not I from do. your heart. Verbally, yes. No, I do. Very strongly. So if you strongly believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, why are you disobeying him? Why? Why are you disobeying him? I don't, I didn't think, oh, I don't think I am disobeying him until now. But I'm quoting you from the Bible, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17. Think not, I have come to destroy okay. the law of the prophets. Okay. And I've given you a quotation from Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 7 to 8. Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verse number 8. Book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse number 2 to 5. References. Okay, if that's the case, in the Old Testament, it is said that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But what did Jesus Christ say? If somebody slaps you, show him the other side. Now, what is, is, isn't that like a defying of the law? No, it's not defying. I will give you what you're quoting is references from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 38. Okay. I will give the quotation. I don't, I don't want the quotation. I want the answer for my question. But first I'll give the quotation reference, then I'll give the answer. Na? Fine, fine. 
I always give with proof. You believe without proof, you can do that. I am a man of proof, with references from okay. your scripture. Okay. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five, verse number thirty-eight. It has been said of the old times that an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, whosoever takes a shirt, give him the cloak. Whoever walks with you one mile, walk with him twain. Whosoever offers you one cheek, offer him the other. That's it. It doesn't mean that he's going against it. But he's showing it has been said of the old times. But those two laws don't correspond. They are totally different. They're totally against each other. But those things, what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's time to get remedy. People misunderstood. They misunderstood the law. An eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth means there should be justice. That doesn't mean someone by mistake, a child is playing cricket, and if the ball hits the eye, that doesn't mean you break his eye. People misunderstood the message. He was correcting it. Same way how you misunderstood the message that Jesus said had folk. Where did he say have folk? It means that people misunderstood. They are following the law by the letter, not by the spirit. What you have to realize that it means that if by mistake someone is playing cricket and suppose the ball hits the eye, that doesn't mean that you have to take the eye of the boy. So you have to follow the law in the spirit. And you have to see the meaning of it. That's important. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tried to explain. I'm asking the question, will you follow Jesus Christ, peace be upon Lord today? If someone slaps you on one cheek, will you offer the other? There are many people waiting in the queue. Will you do that? I'm sorry? There are many people waiting in the queue. Okay. Will you follow Jesus' law? If someone slaps you, will you offer the other? No, will but that is wrong then. According to me, it is wrong. According to you, it is correct, na? You believe Jesus Christ is your God, peace be upon him. Yes. If someone slaps you, will you offer the other sheep? You can come on the stage here. We'll have many people slapping you. I didn't understand actually. It's See, not clear. That verse of the Bible also says someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other. Yeah. Do you believe in that law? I do, yes. So if someone slaps you, will you offer the other cheek? Exactly. If I don't, that means I'm disobeying his laws. That's okay. it. Okay. Suppose if I tell that from today, everyone will come and hit you on the cheek. Maybe once or twice you'll offer. Will you offer always? Well, uh, that depends on my depth of the faith. I mean, if I'm a really strong believer, then I would definitely offer. Is any Christian worth the name born today who will keep on offering his cheek? I have not met anyone. Do you agree that 30,000 people here, 30,000 slaps, will you take? But believe me, there are really true believers who would. I am asking you, will you leave us as a will you? I don't know. That means you're not a believer. That's no, what we realize it is. I don't know Therefore, what we realize that every prophet came and for remedy. Today, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come. And he said, depending upon the situation, if it is by mistake, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth is wrong. If it is required, sometimes you can offer your cheek, but not always. If always, if you offer the cheek, where is justice? If that way someone kills you, you allow them to kill again? Is this justice? It's not justice at all. Depending upon the situation, you have to keep on changing. Therefore, I say that I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, which match with the Quran. If it doesn't match with the Quran, what I say, it's an interpolation, it's a concoction, it's a fabrication. Because everything written in the Bible is not the word of God. According to scholars of Christianity, they say there are many interpolations in the Bible, there are many concoctions, there are many fabrications. According to Christian journals, they say there are 50,000 errors in the Bible. How many? 50,000. So therefore, I don't consider the Bible to be the word of God. There are many unscientific things mentioned in the Bible. If you read the book of Genesis, you know, I can give a lecture only on it's the okay. contradictions, on unscientific things. I don't consider the word of God. Do you consider the Bible to be the word of God? Yes. Okay. Now, do you know the book of Genesis, chapter number one? Yes. Verse number 16. It says, Almighty God created two lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. Bible says the light of the moon is its own light. Do you believe in that? The light of the moon is? Is its own light. Do you believe in that? No. That we don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number 14, Almighty God, He created the earth on the third day, created the sun on the fourth day. That means the earth and vegetables came before and sun came later on. Do you know science, brother? I'm sorry? Do you, do you know science? Yes. The Bible says earth came first and then came sun. Is it correct? I don't know. No. Scientifically, is it correct? 
Uh, the earth came first and? Then the sun came. Earth came on the third day, sun came on the fourth day. Is it possible? We it know is. the sun is the parent body in the solar system. All the planets that revolve around the sun, they are the bodies from the sun. You know the Big Bang? Yes. So it is created simultaneously. But the Bible says earth on the third day, along with vegetables, sun on the fourth day. How can the vegetables survive without sunlight? Is it if, possible? If, if God can make it that way, why not? But do you believe in that? See what God can do, but will God do something which is wrong? Illogical thing God will do. See, reasoning with God, I don't, I don't think it is in our scope. It is beyond our scope. It is not in your scope, but in the scope of human beings like me. God has to be logical. You can't be illogical. Then if you say illogical, then you believe every monkey, any stone, any tree is God. But, but what, brother, you... what our brothers in India do? Everything is God for them. And then you say, don't argue with God. Don't reason with God. So then you start worshipping the stone also. Brother, you can't be illogical. Seek ye the truth, the truth shall free you. Thank you. So hope you seek the truth, brother. Sure. I appreciate the patience of the uh, questioners. Should we have the next question from the sister? Good evening. My name is Mylene. I'm working in printing industry. Um, I really praise God for your life, Dr. Nike. And I truly believe that you are an army of God. And I feel so blessed to be here. Thank you. Yes, I'm a Mujahid. Yes. Mujahid means soldier of God. <laughs> I consider myself a soldier of God. And thank you because I say I'm a Mujahid. I'm a Dai and a servant of God. Jazakallah. Sister, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, according to Jeremiah 29 11, uh, for God knows the plan He has prepared for each and every one of us. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us hope and a future. Uh, that's why uh, some of women, we believe that they have a gift of celibacy. We're in, uh, you know, that nuns and some women, they're very happy, unmarried. That's because they have a gift of celibacy. Now, Islam believe on that, and if not, what is the best motivational verse that you can give, which is based in Quran, for those women who is second, third, or fourth wife? Sister asked the question, quoting Jeremiah, she said that the future is with God, and some women are blessed to be celibacy, that means they should not marry, and what do you have to say, and what does the Quran say about that? Sister, in Islam, there is no monasticism in Islam. You cannot renounce the world. Our beloved Prophet said that anyone who does not marry is not of me. According to me, it is compulsory to marry in Islam. The Prophet said anyone who does not marry is not of me. To marry is compulsory. Regarding those women who are blessed, you know, you are referring to the nuns, correct sister? Nuns, yes. Now if you see the statistics, if you see the statistics of the priest, those who have given up the world, you know, the fathers and the nuns. In England, the statistics say that more than 60%, more than 60% of the priests and the nuns, they involve in adultery. More than 60% even involved in homosexuality. So what is this celibacy you're talking about? Medically, it's not possible. Medically, it's not possible for a woman or a man to remain virgin throughout the life without indulging in illicit sex. It's not possible. Because sex hormones are being liberated, sister. It may look to the world that she is following celibacy. It's not possible. It's not possible. Because sex hormones are being liberated, sister. So therefore, if you see the statistics, that's the reason the Protestants, what they say, a priest can marry. It is the Catholics who say, that the nuns and the fathers cannot marry. But the pastors in Protestantism, they can marry. If you are a Catholic, they say that you should not marry. But in the Bible, nowhere does it say that you should not marry. Nowhere does it say. It is St. Paul saying that, not Jesus Christ. St. Paul saying that, I would prefer not marrying rather than burning. St. Paul, not Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ never said that you should lead a life of celibacy. That is the reason in Islam, Marrying is compulsory, and the Prophet said, a person who does not marry is not of me. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yeah, thank you. And uh, one more. 
Uh, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Sister, that was the question that do I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe. It's mentioned in the Bible, he'll come again. It's mentioned in the Quran also, he'll come again. But what is the reason that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will come again? The reason is because, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up Isa alayhi salam alive. Jesus Christ alive. The reason is, he was the only messenger whose followers as a whole mistook that he claimed divinity. All the other messengers, none of their followers as a whole misunderstood that the messenger was God. Because there was a misunderstanding in the followers, Almighty God raised him up alive. It's further mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. Jesus Christ, peace be upon rest to Almighty God. On that day, I will come in the second coming. And I will bear witness. I never told them to worship me. But I said, Oh, Budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. He will come in the second coming to testify to the Christians. He never told them that worship me. He never said that he was Almighty God. So he'll come in the second coming to testify to the Christian that this is a big mistake. Same thing is mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John. On that day when people will come, Oh Lord, Oh Master, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? So Jesus Christ will say, Amen, you depart from here. I don't even know you. So Jesus Christ will say, I don't know these people. You did miracles in my name, I don't even know you. So he never claimed he was God. In his second coming, he will clarify this misconception. That is the reason God kept him alive in his second coming, so that no one can say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. And the one last question. Um, Makkah is the same as the Holy of Holies in the Bible? Makkah? Yes. Yes. There is mention of Makkah in the Bible. If you read in the book of Psalms, chapter number 84, verse number 4 to 7, it says that blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakka. Now Bakka is another name for Mecca which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 96. The first place for worship was Bakka. So Bakka is another name for Mecca which is also mentioned in the Bible that blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakka. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you very much. The next question from the brother on my left. Ramadan Karim to everyone. My name is Victor. I work with al Futem. My question, first question, I have a few questions to ask. Who is God? Brother, that's a question. Who is God? And this is the same question that was asked by the Christians to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was, what should I answer? We can keep on speaking about God. Then the revelation came. Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Kul Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufana. There's nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Almighty God given in the Quran. Any candidate you say is Almighty God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. The first is Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Number two, Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yulid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakul la kufanat, there's nothing like him. This is the four line definition of Almighty God. Whoever you worship and say is God, if he fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as God. Hope that answers the question. Okay. If I do say God is a strength, for instance, I give an example just to explain to my point. If it's raining, just leave aside the scientific way of rain, how it comes. The rain, how it forms, and how it rains, and how it ends, can I just say that's God? Just leave aside the scientific way. Brother, I said that if I just say how it rains, leave a fight scientific, if I say that is God, is it correct? No, it's not correct. It goes against the definition of God I gave you. What you can say, it is from God, min Allah, no problem. Okay. But you can't say that is God. Rain is not God. Is he one? No. Begets not. It contradicts most of the definition of Surah Ikhlas. What you can say, it is from God, min Allah, no problem. Hope that answers the question. Okay. We'll just allow some other non-Muslims and we'll come back to you, brother. Shall we have the next question from the 
Mill Lyle. Morning, Mr. Nayak, and uh, my name is Soumya, and uh, working in the field of media for last two years over here. My question is related to media itself. That, uh, as been told by you, that uh, media has created a perception or a wrong uh, perception of Islam, and uh, as in uh, the people, they are believing that uh, Islam is blind uh, due to this media. But uh, my question is that. Uh, right now, as in, uh, you can take an example of India, the uh, percentage of the literate people is more than the percentage, is very minimum as in the illiterate peoples. So no one is really forcing the literate peoples to follow that particular news of blah, 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 shit, but uh, they are believing that uh, what they are seeing on that particular media. Could you please uh, tell me that how media is making the people wrong perception of uh, Islam? Brother, that's the question that how is media creating a wrong perception of Islam? Brother, I've given a full talk. Full talk explaining the media is saying things which doesn't exist in Islam. And I've given the talk on media and Islam war of peace. It's a full talk. And giving various strategies used by media. What does media do? Media picks up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. What does media do? Media quotes verses of the Quran out of context. Media says things about Islam that don't exist in Islam. Media says women are subjugated. Where are they subjugated? I have given a full talk and speech on this topic. Media and Islam, war or peace. Please see that cassette and that was the talk I had given last time when I was called by the Dubai International Holy Quran Award. That was four years back. You can surely take the DVD and see it, inshallah. The next question from the sister side. Uh, my name is Florenda. I'm a Christian. And I have followed all your talks. And uh, I really admire um, listening to you regarding, you know, I mean, comparison between Christianity and Islam. It's my pleasure to ask you a question. Actually, um, a while ago, it was uh, asked regarding the judgment day or the second coming. Um, I believe that Christian and Muslim believe on that and uh, both religions are preparing on the judgment day. Um, I have a friend who is a Muslim and he always uh, told me that I'll be safe in Islam. Now I wanted to ask you, what's the difference between you know, um, preparation of Christian and the Muslims to be safe in the second life and how you will encourage me to embrace Islam. Sister, the difference between a Muslim and a Christian preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and the day of judgment is, the Christian is waiting for Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as Almighty God to come. We Muslims are waiting that he will come and clarify that he is not God. He will come and follow the commandments of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. So Jesus Christ said about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if I have to help you, I will tell that follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Only if you believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will you be safe on the day of judgment. So to help you, I would say, that besides believing in Almighty God, you have to believe that Jesus is a messenger of God and you also have to believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God, sister. Sister, do you believe that there is one God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is God or is he a messenger? Messenger. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is messenger? Yes. So that means you are a Muslim, sister. <laughs> Would you like to say it in Arabic? Uh, yes. I'll just repeat the kalma in Arabic and you can repeat it. Ashadu. 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 Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abdu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness. Bear witness. That. That there is no God, there is no God, but Allah, but Allah, and I bear witness, and I bear witness 
that, that Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad is, is his, messenger his messenger and servant of God. Sorry. And servant of God. And servant of God. MashaAllah. Jadakallah, sister. Thank May Allah reward you. you. May Allah accept your efforts. And inshallah, inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he save you from the hellfire and may he grant you Jannah on the day of judgment, inshallah. Thank you. Shall we have the next question from the brother again? In prayers, is it right to pray to God to ask him that I want to see you? The brother asked the question that is it right in prayers to ask God that I want to see you? If you say, I want to see you in the next life, it's acceptable. If you say, I want to see you in this life, it's not possible. Because there's a verse in the Quran, which is mentioned in Surah Taha, that Musa alayhi salam, the messenger of God, he said, I want to see God. So God said, look at the mountain. I will show my glimpse to the mountain. You look at the mountain, what happens? So the moment God showed a glimpse to the mountain, the mountain fell out of ruin, and Moses, peace be upon him, fainted. You cannot see God in this world. In this life, you cannot. But on the Day of Judgment, there are many things of the Prophet that in Jannah, we would love to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, face of Almighty God. And that would be a pleasure for us. So if you pray that may you see Allah in the next life, in Jannah, inshallah, very good prayer. But you can't see Almighty God in this world. Hope that answers the question. The next question, quickly from Inshallah, we'll just permit one more round from the non-Muslims. And there's a request from the chairman of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award, that all the brothers who have accepted Islam, the sisters can wait at the side. I wouldn't request them to come on the stage. But all the brothers who had accepted Islam, the chairman personally would like to congratulate them. If they would like, if they are willing, if they are present here, they should come on the stage, inshallah, after we answer the last session. The brothers and sisters, the sisters can wait in the sister section, but the brothers can come on the stage. The chairman, Mr. Ibrahim Bumala, would like to congratulate them personally. So the brothers, the few brothers who have accepted Islam, if you are here and if you have not gone away, please make it a point to come on the stage. I too would like to meet you. So inshallah, we'll just take the last three questions and then inshallah, give a personal congratulation to the brothers who accepted Islam. By the time the volunteers can see to it that the brothers who accepted Islam can please come on the right of the stage and then come on the stage later on. Yes, brother. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Zakir Naik. You're a big help. Um, I have one more question. I'm a bit confused between the two verses in Quran. Um, the first one is in Surah Baqarah 62, yeah, which says that if you believe in one God and believe in the last day and do good deeds, yeah, you shall have nothing to fear on the day of judgment yeah, and you will get your reward with your Lord. Yeah? Mind it, in this Surah, it doesn't say it, uh, that you have to believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the last messenger. And there is also another surah which supports this, which is the 22, in chapter number 22 and verse number 17, I think, in which it says a similar thing, that those who, do, who believe in one God, who believe in the last day and who do good deeds will be fine on the day of judgment. But then there is also one more verse in the Quran which says that whosoever amongst you comes to me without the religion of Islam, it shall not be accepted of him and he shall be among the losers. So... In that last verse, does Islam mean believing in one God and believing in Prophet Muhammad and believing in all the other rituals? Or because Islam means submission, so whoever has submitted, yeah, is submitted. So, you know, what's the meaning of Islam in the last verse? The brother asked a very good question. He's quoted the verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 62, that all those who believe in Allah and believe in the last day, irrespective of whether they are Jews or Christians or Sabians, they shall have no fear and inshallah they will have the reward. Similar thing is repeated in Surah Maida chapter number 5. So brother is asking that here the verse doesn't mention believing in Prophet. If you read the context of this revelation brother, what happened? People came to the Prophet and said that we have been Jews, we have been Christians, we have been Sabians. Can God forgive us? In that context the reply was given as long as you believe in Allah and the last day, irrespectively previously, whether you are a Christian or a Jew or a Sabian, you will get the reward. It does not mean today a person who says he's a Christian and who believes Jesus is God, he will go to Jannah. No, it does not mean that. Not Jesus is God, believes in one God. Ah, believes in one God. But if they believe Jesus is God, then they won't go then to Jannah. That's fine. But my, fine. Concept, my point is, yes. believes in one true God. Correct. So he has to believe in one true God. And if he believes in true God, he also follows the commandment of God. Simple. Yeah, but maybe he's confused with that, yeah? So that means he's believed in a confused God. 
no, he believe he he believes in his creator yeah but he he is not yet reached that level so then if you ask me the question a person who truly believes in god and little bit confused from his heart and yet doesn't believe in prophet muhammad will he go to heaven or hell that's your question my question is he is clear that there is one god clear there is one god he is confused in the prophet he does not do idol worship he does does not do that he believes in one god and does good deeds and believes in the last day can he go to jannah is your question yes fine this answer and i come to your last question also about that islam is only way of life quran says in surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 48 and surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 116 if allah pleases he may forgive any of your sin but the sin of shirk he'll never forgive okay if yeah. allah pleases he will forgive any sin mm. but the sin of shirk he'll never forgive yeah. this means the only sin that god will never forgive 100% is associating partners with god sure okay. so if you believe in one god yeah. don't associate partners but do not believe in prophet muhammad yeah. can you go to heaven yes chances are they very bleak okay maybe 0.0000000001% I can't say 100% no, because yeah. if you're not doing shirk, other verses talk about Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Yeah. So if you truly believe, you have to believe in Prophet Muhammad. Yes. But if you ask me, no. Suppose I believe in God and if I die today. Yes. If you did good deeds, you believed in God. Chances are they very very little. Like you jump from the hundredth floor, yes. chances you live is there. Yes. How so much? How much are the chances? How much are the chances of getting saved? How much is it? So if you jump from the bridge. Yeah. Buruj of Dubai. And then you're going to go to hell. I mean, then I'm no, then no. you're going to die. No die. <laughs> can you live yet you can live. Chance is 0.001%. Yes. So the same chance is here. But I Because, no I have two verses of the Quran supporting yeah. me that you believe in one God, you do good deeds and you believe in the last day you shall have nothing to fear on that day. That's what I tell you. Yeah. Two verses but the context of the verse is what? Yeah, that the context know. of the verse is when people came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they wanted to accept Islam. That previously we were Jews, we were Christians. Then the verse is there. The yeah. context is important. And coming back to your first question, mm -hmm. that Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter three, verse number nineteen, in Nadina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is submitting our will to God. Submitting, yeah. Submitting will to God. So, and Quran also says in Surah Al Imran, chapter three, verse eighty-five, if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him, and he shall be amongst the losers. Yes. So now submitting our will to God means first you have to find out which is the true God. Yes. And when you find out, you have to come to Allah. Yes. You can't say I believe in true God, but is Jesus? I believe in no, true God. No, I believe. I believe in Allah. Huh. That's. So if you believe, believe in Allah, in God, yes. you have to follow what is the commandment of Allah. Now, well, when I, you believe in Allah, and if you don't come to commandment of Allah, that means it is not a true Allah. I believe Allah is not created by anyone. He is not born of anyone. He doesn't have kids. Uh, he, you know. Correct. Kul hu Allahu ahad Allahu samalam yalud balam yulad balam. Mashallah. I believe in that. Mashallah. Yeah, but that's okay. that's where my state is. That's right. Yeah. So now, now that's not complete Islam. That's part of Islam. Yeah. Part of Islam. Yeah. So now, part of Islam will take you to heaven. Chances are very little. Very little. Right, right. You know, very little. Right. Even believing in Prophet alone will not take you to Jannah. You may believe in one God, believe in Prophet, but do bad deeds, you will not go to heaven. Fine. Yeah. So what you have to realize, your chances is very bleak, like jumping from Buruj to Dubai, right. and then living. That's your chance. If you believe that true God, when you know where you got those Kulwal Lawas from, where? From hmm. where you got this from Kulwal Lawas? I got it from the Quran. From the Quran. Yes. So from the Quran, you also get. Yeah, Surah Muhammad. That that Chabad. part agrees with my brain. That part agrees with my brain. Yeah, the rest I have questions. So uh, what question you have asked me? I will try and. Right. <laughs> so on the day of judgment, I can tell you, I gave this brother. I tried to remove the misconception. Right. Okay. I'll take. Uh, well, that's a little bit of a private question. I'll ask you through email. Okay. Fine. One no problem. Question, the last question. So when you ask from email. Yeah. When you get convinced, that time I'll ask you to believe in Prophet Muhammad also. Sure. Sure. Okay. Fine. Yeah. My last question is. Uh, we see uh, this uh, the the style of uh, the kalima, yeah, that la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah means there is no god but Allah, and Muhammad is a messenger of God, yeah. Now Islam uh, has this distinct style. I have not seen this style in Christianity or Judaism. That kind of kalima, do I don't know? I mean, is was there the same no. kind of kalima in no. those two religions as well? No. You know why? Yeah. Because it says there is no god but Allah. Yeah, and similar, Pro similar, similar in those lines. I'll tell you. And Prophet Muhammad is a messenger and servant, so no one should worship Prophet Muhammad. Therefore, it's mentioned there. 
Fine. Yeah, Tomorrow, so, people should not start worshiping Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Yes, yes. We love him. We respect him. We revere him. We are ready to die for him, but we don't worship him. I understand. So maybe in Christianity, they could have something like there is only one God and Christianity, Jesus, Father, and Jesus, peace be upon Father, him. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, no, but I'm talking about what Jesus told, not what Christians are telling today. At every time of the Prophet, it was La ilaha illallah, that time Isa or Rasulullah, no problem. It was, it was that time? No, that is what people had to believe in, not yeah. in Arabic, in the language they spoke. No, what I'm saying is from your yes. study, from your yes. study, have you yes. found a kalima like that in, in what mm. Jesus would have not, said? Not in Arabic. Okay. At every time, that you had to believe in the Prophet to be a Muslim. Yeah. So at that time you have to believe in one God and you have to believe Jesus was the prophet of God. At the time of Moses you have to believe that there is no God but Allah and Moses was the messenger of Allah. You have to believe in that. I understand but did you see that reference? It in, is understood. In... There is no reference in the Quran. The because... Quran says they were messengers. It is understood. And if I don't believe in Jesus, now also I am not a Muslim. Quran right. says you have to believe in each and every messenger today. Yeah. So believing that time was a must. Yeah. And today you have to believe in Musa salam, and Isa salam. You are asking the question, did you have to believe that time? Simple no, logic, no, I, yes. I know you have to believe at that time as well. Yes. What I am saying is, why don't I see any, any, any kalima like that in today's Christianity or Judaism? Because today's Christianity has changed Christianity. How about Judaism? I it don't is see. It has changed, brother. The so, Bible so, they that, removed, so they removed the basic of, of the kalima? Of course, of course. They have changed the messenger to God. Yeah. It is mentioned in the Bible today also that Jesus is not God. He never claimed divinity. He is yeah. a messenger of God. Yeah. So that's what the teaching of the church is. Yes. Today's form is the changed form. How, how about Judaism? They still believe there is only one God. They don't regard Moses as God. So, did you see a kalima like uh, there is only one God and Mo Musa al Rasul Allah or something? No, like but that? they believed that Musa al Salam was the messenger of God. They yeah. believed in that. Yeah, but At the same time, they even believed that he was an imposter. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So, that's wrong. Yeah. yeah. If you believe Jesus is an imposter, now Billah, that is wrong. So, so you find uh, some of the other mistakes here or there. Right. Therefore, Quran is the Furqan. Quran, yeah. Furqan means the criteria to judge right from wrong. So yeah. whatever matches with the Quran, we agree with the word of God. What is against the Quran contradicts, we say not the word of God. What doesn't contradict and doesn't match, ambiguous, may be right, may be wrong. I understand your point, sir. What I'm saying is, did you see any reference in probably in your study of Judaism? Probably no. that the Kalima of the, so no. even the Kalima is gone. I mean, they don't no. even have that. Maybe I, in Aramaic, maybe it will be in Aramaic. Or I don't know. Language. I don't know of any such. Right, right, right. So I mean, so 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 they were still believing in this thing that you have to believe in Moses as messenger. But, yes. But there is nothing concrete like Laila Halala or you know like. I don't know of any in the scripture. Right, right. Okay, right. Okay. Well, my last question is. Um, uh, Third last, fourth last. This last. Yeah. Last of the last. Just last. Recent, last of the last. Last of the last. Yes. Recently in India, it was in the news that uh, same-sex marriages got allowed. Yeah. And, and uh, on reading upon it, yeah, I found out that they said that it is at the genetic level of people, genetic, it's in the hormones, yeah, what they desire, what they don't desire. Now, I understand that Islam is completely against this, it doesn't allow this, but what I'm saying is, if someone's got that it, at a genetic level, yeah, and it's his choice, Very good and, and he, was, he, was, he was born with that, uh, with that kind of tendency, and yet Islam chooses to, uh, to punish him on Tenus something, on something that he was born with. I agree with you. So God it should. It sounds illogical. Yeah. So God, right. God made him like that, and yeah. uh, God is punishing him for that as well. Brother asked a question that recently in India homosexuality has been permitted, not permitted, but the law says it's not a big crime that was there in the Indian Constitution. Yes. They have softened it, not permitted yet. Yes, yes. It is a court case that took place in Delhi. It's not a law yet. Yes. There's a who and cry yet. There are many organizations fighting against it. So no law. It's a law in Canada, in yeah. USA, in UK, not in India yet. Right. Okay. Yeah. And today there are some scientific research that say that homosexuality is genetic. Yes. yes. So the brother asked the question: If homosexuality is genetic, then who's to blame? How can you consider it to be a sin? Very good question. Yes. This research was done earlier, a few years back, and later on, what was found out that this is totally false, right. and the person who propounded this himself was homosexual. Right. Okay. So there's no scientific proof yet. It's an assumption. Right. Science doesn't testify yet that homosexuality is genetic. Right. In fact, Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number seven, verse number eighty-one, which says that, "Do you have lust for men more in preference to women?" To homosexuality. Yeah. Talking about Qawm yes. al It is prohibited in the Bible also talking about Lut al -Salam. Yes. Also in the Quran it is prohibited. Yes. Homosexuality is prohibited completely. Right. It is the assumption that it's genetic. It's not genetic at all. How does it happen? I'll tell you. Yeah. The psychology they tell us 
that once you overdo a thing, you start losing the pleasure. Right. So what God has permitted the normal sexual way of life, you start overdoing it. You start doing unnatural things. Right. What God has permitted natural things, you do unnatural. You start doing from the reverse side. So once you get fed up of doing it so often, that's the reason scientific research says a person who has no extramarital affairs enjoys the sexual life with his wife and husband the maximum. Yeah, but this tendency is found in small children. I mean, you know, I'm I mean, you. yeah, so I mean, they have not got married yet or let tasted me, it. Let me complete. Yeah, yeah. I'll come to children later on. For them, talking about the adults. Yes. <laughs> How it comes in children, I'll tell you it. Okay. So what happens is once you start overdoing it, you want to enjoy more. So that thing what is normal doesn't excite you any longer. Then you start doing unnatural things. It's not genetic, right. talking about children. Yeah. How does children come? It doesn't just come out from birth. It's not from birth. Yeah. Because they watch pornographic movies. Right. They watch blue films. It's haram. The parents, the way they behave in front of the children. All this has a psychological impact on the child. Right. Don't tell a person who's born, then he starts becoming homosexual. It's not like that at all. It's right. a misconception. Right. Scientific research doesn't say that. Right, right, right. Okay. It is because of the overexposure. Now children watch the blue films. Yeah. The channels. Free to air. You know, there are yeah. more pornography channels than other channels. Yeah. Very good money. So because of the media, that's how when they see on the channel, they start emulating and that's how they divert. Right. Who's to blame? The channel. Right. Why right. did the parent allow them? Right, okay. So they will be responsible for that. Right, okay. Okay, and that, that answers me, that's fine. Uh, one thing you said was that Brother, God, God has to be... Last of the last question. Yeah, just, God has to be logical, you said, yeah? So why did he choose... Not God has to be logical, God is logical. God is logical, okay. So why did he choose, uh, 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 taking into account Islam is the correct religion, why did he choose to bring you into this world in Islam and so many others in a different religion? So, so that good. means he's being partial from the birth. Very good, very good question. Yeah. Brother, the question that... Some people are born in Muslim family and a person born in Muslim family, chances, Muslim, born in non-Muslim family, non-Muslim. So why is God impartial? Maybe if you were born in a Muslim family, you would have been a Muslim. Yes. Correct? Yes, yes. Very That's good how question. it usually goes. Very good question. The criteria to go to Jannah is not to be born in a Muslim family. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. He's born as a Muslim. Yeah. He submits civil to God. Later on, he's been influenced by his parents, by his elders, by his teachers. Then he starts doing idol worship, fire worship. He converts. Therefore, okay. when a non-Muslim becomes the Muslim, the more appropriate word is revert rather than convert. He yeah. comes back to the original faith. Yeah. Now, the criteria to go to Jannah is not to be born in a Muslim family. Sure. The criteria to go to Jannah is Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal as innal insan al that by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The criteria go to Jannah is all four things. Iman, righteous deeds, exhorting people to truth, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If a person is born in a Muslim family, the first criteria the chances are more, yes. not the remaining three. Yes. Fine? Now you, you may be born in a righteous family, but not having Iman. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, why was he born in a Christian family or a Hindu family? You know, he should be born. Brother, I mean, it's more likely that he gets the other things easily. There are four things to go to Jannah. If a person is born in a Muslim family, but does not have righteous deeds, does not do dawah, he'll go to hell. Yeah, okay. He will not go to heaven. Yeah, Only by having a name, Zakir, Muhammad, Abdullah, Sultan, will not take you to heaven. Even practice is important. You may be born in a family which has righteous deeds, but may not be having Iman. So everyone has different combinations. But Almighty God says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, Sanuri mayatina fil afakhi wa fi hanfusim hatta yatabayyana annaulak. Soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. So Allah takes it upon Himself that to every human being, he'll put in his heart directly that this is the truth. Like how God sent me to put it directly into your heart here. Yeah. Correct? So, no, now, but, so you now, mean to wait, say there wait, is wait, no wait, advantages? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. No, no, there are advantages. advantages. So, it's a big advantage. You got everything very easy. 
But for a person who is in a different religion, it's, it's a he doesn't even come Brother, to know about it Brother, you got so easy. Yeah. In three hours, you got it directly. Very easy. Right or wrong? I you don't think it to be easy. Yes. See how you take it. I'm saying how lucky you are compared to the other non-Muslims. You attended my talk. Yes. Yet you're not accepting it. Who's to blame? You are God. Yes. You. Yeah, but there are not things. Me. There are things. <laughs> there are a lot. No, religion no, no, is a no, big no, thing. One not big to. thing. You want to make it big, you make it big. You want to make it important, it's important. Yeah. The problem is that Almighty God puts in every human being directly. Not always to Dr. Zakir Nai. Yeah. I am only 0.00001%. Yeah. It's not me. Some through me, some through others, some directly. So on the day of judgment, you cannot complain to God. Leave other, at least you cannot complain. Yeah. You cannot go and tell God, I didn't know about Islam. Yeah, I cannot. Yeah, you I cannot. Can. Yeah, I cannot. Because you know, you may be having more knowledge of Islam than many Muslims born in Muslim families. Yeah, because the way you're quoting Quran, the yeah. way you're asking me question, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So now after reading so much about Islam, mm -hmm. and yet if you don't accept, Allah will question you. Yeah. You have no excuse whatsoever. The other non-Muslim will deal with them afterwards. Yeah. Let's talk about you first. Yes. Yeah, so you I, have no question at all yes. on the day of judgment. I have. I, I can say there, there were a few things which I was, I did not get the right answers no, to. No, there are many Muslims who are born in Muslim family, not few, have many questions which are not answered. Yes. You have few, they have many. So you are in a better position. You cannot complain to God. I you have say, few questions not answered. I would, give God, I would give God that these are the basis because they did not get answered. That's why I did not accept it. If I don't accept it, maybe which, I will later. I don't know. Which question think. you don't have, tell me now. <laughs> tell me now, come on. <laughs> You can tell God, Dr. Zakir Naik asked you in front of 20, 30,000 people, what question you don't know about the well, Quran, come on. First of all, I, the answer that you gave, that it was, it's because of media and blue films. I know, I know small, small kids who don't even have access to that and still they have do, that, those Which tendencies. kids? Name them. What nonsense are you talking? Yeah. I'm a medical doctor. What do you know? I've seen are you a medical doctor? I have seen it. Are you a medical doctor? Well, let me tell you. I, I have I'm seen asking, my... Are you a medical doctor? Yes I'm or no? I'm not. I'm Fine. an engineer. I'm a medical doctor. Fine. Okay. Now you are telling a doctor you have seen. If I tell you that I have seen a building made of paper, you know, come in Bombay. I have seen a building, the pillars were made of paper. Will you believe in it? I won't. I have not seen it. You are finished. Yeah. See, this is the first alu ahli zikri in Gundula Talamut. Ask the person who knows. Now yeah. I have seen, you have seen. Does it carry weight? Yeah. yeah. I have seen a building made of paper. Will you believe? No, but your point is that it's only because of media, but I know... I no, know point so is it is not genetic. There is no scientific proof at all, it is genetic, I'm telling you. Right, right. What I'm telling you, it can be one of the reasons. Yeah. What is, there can be 20 other reasons. Right. One of the reasons can be media. Yeah. You tell me it can't be media, I'll disprove you. Right, right. right. One of the reasons can be media. Right. Fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. Actually, I have to go through all the other questions Very I have go through, and I will need some time and then Take maybe your time, I will do it. But, but, yeah. hope it's not too late. I don't know how long I'm going to live. But see, if I die I, in the state of getting more knowledge, yeah, then I can always tell God that I was, no, just, no, I was just getting more and more knowledge. You cannot, you cannot. I'm As telling you, you I, cannot. You cannot. I will give Shahada on the day of judgment. I give you a chance. You cannot. See, I don't know I'm going to live tomorrow or not. See, 90% of my questions are answered, but I have to go through more things. People accept Islam with 10% acceptance. So that girl, according to me, you have more knowledge than all the people who accepted Islam, according to mine. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Maybe that's true. But my principle is, unless I'm 100% clear, I will, I will not no. take such a big step. I will only take that big step if Brother, I'm 100% clear. many things you did in life without knowing 100%. Did you know how much you're going to earn in Dubai that you came here 100%? Yeah, See, that way I'm ready to say the, the, the thing. But, but the thing is, I've seen some thing? Muslims who say that if, if you have an iota of doubt, then you're not a Muslim. So who said that? Who said that? They say if you have... If are you, you going to follow the Quran? Are you going to say some Muslim? Forget about Muslims. No, you, you want to, to be, judge? You have, you have to believe it in 100%. If you if you, even if you have 99% faith. Who said that? Not, who said that? Does the Quran say that? It doesn't say that. You follow Quran, don't follow the other Muslims. Don't follow me, also follow Quran. So if I tell you, if I tell you that I believe that Prophet Muhammad was a prophet of God 90% and 10% I have doubts, am I, am I a Muslim? See, you, t you tell no, me that. do you believe in messenger or not a God? I other doubts are separate. I believe in one God and I believe in his messengers. 90%. I, I believe in his, yes, 90%. I have Which 10% you don't believe? Tell me now, I'll clarify I, I that. I can't recall those questions now. Why? No, yeah, so you I can't recall? Go. This is escapism. No, not really. I'm I am not, am true to I'm, my heart I am I'm not, not escaping. I am not asking you to accept Islam. I'm not asking you. I know. I'm only telling you, if God forbid something happens to you before you accept Islam, you will not be forgiven. I'm only telling you See, I'm not an going, advice. 
I'm not being prejudiced here. I'm too, being too... Take I'm your not... time. Take your time. When you need me, you can call me on the email. Sure. Zakir at irf.net. My pleasure to reply to you, brother. How do you spell irf? I-R-F.net. I -R -F irf.net. Okay. It's a short form for Islamic Research Foundation. Right, okay. Yes, or you can watch me on Peace TV. Sure. Inshallah. All right, okay. Thank you so much. See you yes, next sir. time. Inshallah. The next question from the sister. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Priya. I work in Dubai and I have a question. It's about a myth that I heard from a few friends about uh, Islam. Uh, it's about marriage, basically. Uh, is it true? that a Muslim can only marry a girl younger? Sister asked the question that, is it true that a Muslim can only marry a girl who's younger? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when first time he married, he was at the age of 25, and his first wife, Khatija, may Allah be peace with her, she was 40 years old. 15 years elder to him. So there's no such statement that you can marry a girl who's younger. You have to marry a girl who's virtuous. The Prophet said, when you look for a life partner, you look for four things. Beauty, wealth, nobility, and virtue. The best is virtue. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw virtue in Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her, and he married her. So best is virtue, sister. Okay, thanks, that's all. You're most welcome. There's a request that inshallah, all those who accepted Islam will give a copy of the translation of the Quran to them. And inshallah, I request the volunteers to arrange some copies of the translation. Inshallah, Mr. Ibrahim Bumala will give the translation. To the gents who have accepted Islam, I would like to request them to be standing below the stage so that after we answer the last question, we can have them come on the stage. Yes, brother. Good morning. First of all, let me congratulate you on having such a eventful and good uh, event here. It was very enlightening. Uh, now let me put forward my question. Now we have seen some interesting debates, some very uh, curious arguments in favor of a religion against another religion. What we're doing is a comparative study in religions. A very logical question. Our goal is not to continue compare religions or say one is better than the other. Our goal is a better uh, society, a better life, a better world, a peaceful world with more compassion and harmony. What is the logical conclusion of this all? Are we saying that Till everybody in the world is not Muslim, we are not going to have a continuum and equilibrium. Or, till everybody is not going to be Christian, we are not going to... Because until, unless everybody is one, this argument is going to continue. What is our goal? What are we heading to? Brother asked the question that we had good arguments, good debates. What is the ultimatum? Do you want to make everyone Muslim? Do you want to make everyone Christians? What is ultimate? Ultimate is to search for peace. Through? Through? Through the Creator Almighty God. The path? The path because, is... Because there is only one path. One path is submitting our will to God. And that is only one path which we know what it is. Yes, submitting our so, will to God. Yes, yeah, so there has to be only one conclusion. One conclusion, correct. In so, Nadina, so, in the so, Lail Islam. So, so the logical end to this is the entire world becomes a Muslim. Not logical end to it. The thing is there that if those who get the truth, those who Allah gives hidayah, they'll become Muslim. Our job is to deliver the message. The Quran mentions in Surah Ghashia, chapter number 88, verse number 21-22, Allah says to the messenger, Fazakir in namanta muzakir. Your job is to deliver the message. Changing hearts, you are not the manager of affairs. Lasta bi musaitir, you are not the manager of affairs. I agree. It is Almighty God. So what are we doing? We are delivering the message. I agree. Changing hearts in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in our hand. I agree. What we are doing, are we getting peace or not? The thing to be noted is, when people say this is the best religion, and if someone else says this is the best, there is comparative study. And logically we can find which is the best. But we cannot continue to compare till the end of the world. There has not to be an the end. Not till the end of the world, till the end of my life. Oh. Till the end of your life. We are here to deliver the message. It is nothing about conversion. We deliver the message, you like it, you accept it, we can't force anyone. No, I'm not saying you about, tell me one I'm thing, irrespective, irrespective of the non-Muslims. You know, majority non-Muslims didn't accept Islam, correct? Yeah. But did they benefit or not? They certainly will. They benefit, that's sufficient. Some people get 10 points, some people 20, some people 100. I maybe agree. maybe I seven, eight people got 100 points benefit. Mr. Jackier, Other people got 10 points. I am satisfied even if you get one point benefit. Mr. Whether Jackier, did you benefit or not from this lecture? I did, I certainly Finish. did. Finish, you benefited, I'm happy. Oh, I'm, I'm not asking you to accept Islam. No, 
no, no, no. If you benefited, I am happy. I benefited. You benefit, I benefit. I benefited. Finish. I thank you a lot. I mean, that was, and especially this open forum question answer session was very enlightening. It basically. And very proved... few people allow such open question answer. Exactly. Have you seen any I mean, Christian? Brother, no. you're a Christian, correct? I'm not a Christian. So what are you? Uh, I'm a Brahmin. Brahmin. Have you seen any Hindu in India having such live open sessions? No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I watched your uh, debate with Ravi Shankar and I saw how it happened. I and, know. Uh, and what happened to him? And what happened to him? And I also know Pope Benedict refused to uh, uh, talk with you on that Quran issue. Now, uh, thank you. Now, what I mean to say is that we are not saying that people should convert to our religion or your religion. We are not saying that. We are open people. We are people on a, a much higher intellectual level. What I am saying is that how is the world going to be for generations to come? Our what should what should we pray? It's not what should we do. See, what we do is in our what we should pray. We should pray to Almighty God. What we should do? We should follow His commandments. We should try to find out the truth. And whichever level you may find ten percent, somebody twenty percent, we have to give the message. So our duty and is to continue giving the message without thinking what the result is going to be. Not without thinking. Without we are giving the message. And we want the people to follow the true message. Whether they accept or not, I'm not bothered. I cannot force anyone. I cannot compel anyone. Fine? Yep. But while giving the message, some people are convinced 10%, some 20%, some 100%. Whatever it is, if I make a difference, I'm happy. Some people may not like it also. That's the Zakir is quoting. They may not like it. So I'm trying my level best to speak the truth and deliver the message. Am I talking about killing anyone here? No. Am I talking about touching anyone? No. So if I'm talking about Mr. humanity based on our Creator Almighty God, then what's the problem? Mr. Jakir, I understand. Have I told that you should kill the Hindus? No. I Have understand. I told you should kill the Christians? I understand your point. If allow someone, me. Allow if me. someone in comparative religion tries to bring animosity, that is wrong. Talking about violence, that is wrong. In other religion, that is wrong. But we are not doing it. And Very good. Us, yes. And let us not talk about people who are doing it. Let us talk about people like you and me who are not doing all that. Very good. Who are only benefiting people by telling them the truth, not forcing them to believe into anything, right? Me and you together. Very good. But if that continues, the division remains. There's no division. The what division, is the division? The division. Brother, I love you, brother. I love you too. But uh, finish. So where's the division? No, I, I, I love all of you. The Christians will still keep preaching. The Judaism let, will still keep preaching. Let them preach. Keep preaching. But there is division still, isn't it? Brother, someone, what do you have I to want, realize? I want to see a, a world with with, with complete uh, compassion and humanity without no divisions. So with, do you think there's no compassion in me? Uh, there's a lot of compassion in you. Do you think there's no humanity in me? A lot of it. So why are you looking at me from the other side? No, I'm not looking at you. I'm asking you a question. I'm not looking at you. I'm basically I'm looking at Pope Benedict who refused to talk to you. So I'm tell Pope Benedict, tell that to Pope Benedict. I am Dr. Zakir Naik, just a student of Islam and comparative religion. I have come here to spread the truth. And I'll continue to spread the truth because that's my message. Because Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33, Waman Asanu kala mimman doil Allahi, Wamila Soli Hau, kala inna nimne Muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works ashes and says a Muslim? That's the reason I changed from a doctor of body to a doctor of a soul. Waakhir Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We request all of you to please. I would please request that those brothers who have accepted Islam. If they can come on the stage, I request uh, Mr. Ibrahim Bumala if you come on the stage and. Congratulations. Sorry. I'd like to say some. We request all the audience to please remain seated. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين نحن سعيدون في هذه الليلة المباركة من ليالي شهر رمضان المبارك بأن نستمع إلى الدكتور ذاكر نايق في هذه المحاضرة وهذه المناقشة الهادفة سواء للمسلمين أو لغير المسلمين من الحاضرين ونحن سعيدون أكثر بأن يسلم في هذه الليلة هذا العدد المتميز من الإخوة والأخوات غير المسلمات وندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى لهم بالتوفيق 
وأن تكون لهم حياة سعيدة في ظل الإيمان وفي ظل الدين الإسلامي الحنيف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the, day, the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most merciful we are very happy here in Dubai International Holy Quran Award to listen from Dr. Zakir Naik his lecture and speeches and we are more happy with those people who got converted to Islam from men and women may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lead all of us to his best way ونبارك للأخوة والأخوات هذه الخطوة الجميلة والطيبة في إسلامهم في هذه الليلة and again we congratulate uh, all of those uh, brothers and sisters who became Muslim from this night and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. ونعتبر هذه ثمرة طيبة من ثمار جائزة دبي الدولية للقرآن الكريم وندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعل الإسلام أجر إسلام هؤلاء في ميزان حسنات صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم راعي ومؤسس هذه الجائزة. And we count those as a fruits of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award activities and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this in page of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President of UAE and ruler of Dubai who assisted this organization, Dubai International Holy Quran Award 13 years back. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. On behalf of Dubai International Holy Quran Awards and the organizing committee of these lectures, first, we would like to thank Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for helping us in conducting this program successfully. We are very grateful to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum and the Dubai Holy Quran Award for inviting Dr. Zakir Naik again to Dubai. Thank you for all of your presence. We conclude this session with the greetings of peace and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.